Hall. Councilor Donovan? Here. Councilor Katarina? Present. Councilor St. Clair? Here. Councilor Blaze? Here. Councilor Benedict? Here. Chairman Sullivan? Here. Um, item 4 will be general public comments. Um, we're also... Go ahead, I'll, I'll adjust it. Keep going. All right. Um, general public comments uh, first. Tonight we give a half an hour. Uh, and then there'll be uh, comments on uh, public hearing on uh, a hearing on the uh, school budget uh, for 2015. So we'll start off with general public comments, name and address. Name is Michael Turek. I live at 11 Bayberry Lane here in Scarborough. Uh, we had a meeting last night about the school budget and uh, the council all asked for feedback uh, prior to tonight. I couldn't get this to you until tonight, but uh, my personal opinion is that you need to reject this school budget and that view is also shared by the 73 people who signed this. Thank you. Thank you. Next. Hi, Peter Slavinsky, 3 Ironclad Road in Scarborough. Um, uh, greetings, uh, Mr. Chair and Council Members. I just want to make some very quick comments about something you'll be consider considering later tonight, the Benjamin Farm. I've been driving past that place for 15 years and always thinking what's going to be happening with it. For eight years, I've actually lived near it now as a Scarborough resident, and I've always hoped that what we're very close to achieving would be achieved. And I just want to make some very, very quick points. Why is it important to conserve that property? It's the largest, last open space east of Route 1, number one. It's contiguous with Rachel Carson Wildlife Refuge lands. It's contiguous with town-owned conservation lands in the, in the Wiley Recreation Area. And it creates contiguous habitat and unsurpassed recreational opportunities, along with being um, headwaters to the Spurlink River. As a recreational trail user myself, living in Scarborough, I actually go to Cape Elizabeth Land Trust Trails to do my recreating because they're closer. It's much farther for me to, for me to go to Fuller Farm, for instance. And I think the strongest uh, notion here is that Scarborough residents overwhelmingly supported land conservation bonds three times now. What better property could we use those funds for than this one? So I urge the council to approve um, the Parks and Conservation Lands Bond Board recommendation for $2 million. And uh, I thank you for your consideration. Thank you. Max? <coughs> Deborah Few Shirtman, 15 Fairway Drive. I look at raising, rising gas prices and I think that they are too high. The fact is, though, that if I want to run my car, I need to pay for the gas. It is easy to look at a big number like a school budget and say it is too high without knowing all the facts. The truth is, Scarborough has the second lowest mill rate and the lowest per pupil spending of all the coastal communities in Cumberland County. Falmouth, with the lowest mill rate, spends over $1,000 more per pupil than Scarborough. Maine historically has the lowest per pupil expenditure in New England. Scarborough's per pupil expenditure is significantly below the main state average, so this disadvantages our children compared to the rest of New England. Scarborough schools have a great reputation, despite having a below average budget request each year. This should bring praise from our citizens and all the members of the town council. Sadly, this is often not what I see in the newspapers. The anti-tax stance is unfairly vented 100% on our schools. We should instead be in turning our displeasure towards Augusta. There has been a 32% reduction in state fundings to the Scarborough schools in the past six years. Surrounding communities, including ones with lower median incomes, seem to understand the importance of a strong school system for the town's health and the next generation's benefit. These communities are passing increased school budgets on first votes trying to build back their school systems in areas like languages and technology. We are doing the opposite. Some think government should just do what the majority votes. Others, like myself, think that government should also educate and lead. I am asking the town council to stand up for the school system and educate the citizens on the realities of an effective school budget and the need to keep a strong school system for a robust and diverse town. 
I am asking that the budget not be reduced as much as advertised. The Town Council needs to act as a leader and support the school administration's desire to have a budget closer to the main state average. Thank you. Excuse me. Folks, uh, no applause, please. Um, we're trying to get through this. Council rules, no applause. Thank you. Uh, good evening. Uh, Katie Foley, Three Lucky Lane. Um, I'm not going to talk about dogs or plovers or taxes or school budgets or any of that, actually. Um, I'm going to tell you, try to tell you, tell you a quick story. Uh, so 24 years ago, I landed at Higgins Beach. Um, I was 20 years old, so now you know how old I am. Uh, it was the first time I saw the Atlantic Ocean, and I was with my two best uh, friends from high school. Um, it was immediately um, the most magical place on earth to me. And the people I met there, the, some of the relationships that I still have today, um, I cherish uh, very deeply. Uh, one of my best friends was Kelly Ann Ziemba, and uh, sadly, she passed away eight years ago. Um, so uh, the day of her funeral, uh, she died on June 2nd, so the day of her funeral, we gathered at Higgins Beach, um, and we looked at her eight-year-old daughter, and we said, Chloe, what, what would your mom tell us if she were to give us some advice today? And her mom said, or C Chloe said, my mom would tell you to live happy. So I have a placard at my house that says live happy. Um, what I've seen in this town the last 10 months, and I am, politics was just never in my blood. Apparently um, there's something that's drawing me to it. But... Um, Living happy, we need to live happy. We need to be working together, whether it's dogs or plovers or beaches or property rights or school budgets or whatever it is. The kind of leadership that we need and expect has to come from all of you and it has to come from this room. Um, I think integrity, civility, and mutual respect, for some reason, is not a town core value anymore. And it's the thing that I fell in love with when I came here from Michigan. Um, and I would like to see that restored in this town. So I'm hoping that while I, I want everyone to say their, speak their mind, I hope they can speak with that kind of civility and truth. Um, it, that's the kind of town that I want to live in, and I think it's the kind of town everybody wants to live in. So uh, we can respect each other's differences. Thank you. Thank you. Next. <clears throat> Good evening. My name is Duncan Perry. I live at 24 Drake Lane in Scarborough. I'd like to thank Dr. Entwistle and the teachers and staff of the Scarborough Schools for their dedication, their commitment, and their hard work. In so saying, I recognize that they are all working under difficult circumstances. A budget that keeps shrinking in the face of continually increasing costs and obligations will eventually lead to a tipping point where excellence is sacrificed owing to insufficient funding. We need to avoid that. Here's what we know about economic development uh, and uh, education from the economic development and educational data that's available. Good primary and secondary education is essential to the success of a child's transition from high school to higher education or to the labor market. There is a direct positive effect on the resale value of property in communities with excellent schools. Successful economic development and excellent schools go hand in hand. Without excellent schools, economic development is severely handicapped. The Scarborough millage is currently 14.77. Data from communities with which the school system compares itself reveals that their millage are almost all higher. At the same time, Scarborough ranks eighth at $77,756 in medium income in Maine, higher than many of the communities with higher millages. So there's a disconnect. We are a comparatively wealthy community, but we are not supporting the school system as well as surrounding communities support theirs. No one I know wants to pay higher taxes, but making our schools state of the art and keeping them there is a civic duty. If we fail in this, the school system will not keep pace with the demands of the 20th century, 21st century. The world isn't what it used to be. It's less safe, it's more expensive for everybody. Uh, salaries, utilities, and other costs of doing business keep rising for everybody, including schools. 
and the number of kids keeps increasing as the population of Scarborough continues to climb. Our school system is a complex business organization that must meet the needs of its kids and community and also meet various state and federal mandates, plus reckon with collective bargaining units, maintenance issues, deferred maintenance, heightened security needs, and pay its bills. To keep cutting a school system budget is like whittling. If you keep going, you have nothing but shavings instead of what you set out to carve. And you can't reassemble shavings. As Warren Buffett has said, it takes 20 years to build a reputation and five minutes to ruin it. We have a good reputation. Please pass the budget without whittling it further. The school board was elected by us, all of us, to be advocates for our children and for our community and for our state. They are conscientious, smart, knowledgeable, and community-minded people, and like the rest of us, they don't want to make uh, raise taxes if it can be avoided, but in this case, it can't be. It can't be if we are to preserve the quality of our school system. On the good news front, the legislature and governor have just passed new legislation, LD1751, and that will afford substantial assistance for the elderly and others in need of tax relief. That should help make those concerned about welfare for the elderly more comfortable. I thank you for listening, and again, I ask you to pass the budget. Thank you. Um, just to remind everybody, try to keep it to three minutes. There's a lot of people here to speak, and we only have 15 minutes left in the public. Martin, <coughs> Martin Tripp. Uh, Comment. <coughs> Oceanwood. Now, these only brush by me, but uh, the town highway department sent a team for snowshoe, uh, snowplow rodeo. You spend, I don't know, two men, six hours to go to a snowshoe rodeo in May, a snowplow rodeo in May. I don't know why these people don't understand that there is budgetary constraints. I just don't get it. You go down from Oak Hill to the Eastern Trail, and they spent probably $20,000 on ornaments and trees. And the best part with it was I asked one of the workers there, was it a town job, what was shaken? And the guy just laughed at me. He almost fell on the ground because he knew it was such a joke. This is, this is crazy. You spend $20,000 on trees. Do we have a town gardener? I don't get it. The last time I was here and spoke to Councilman Sullivan, I said, why are we putting $120,000 in the Oak Hill School? And he says, Tom Hall says that, uh, well, it's a bad investment, but that's what we're thinking about doing. Right next to me. If it's a bad investment, what are we doing it for? The Oak Hill School should be sold. We don't get any tax out of it. We spend, and I'm figuring, a half a day a week in cutting grass and plowing for that one business. That's 26 weeks a year that a man works on the Oak Hill School just to maintain it so we have a money-losing business. Okay, the school budget we sent. I don't know how many kids, but two teachers to Hawaii, and it just passed by, but I think, and I'm not sure, that the school board approved the $2,000 expenditure to send them there. It just was so fast, I didn't notice it. But two teachers went. If they went for three days, they got paid for it, I'm pretty sure. That's probably $900 for two teachers' pay. And then you got two substitute teachers at $125 a day for three days. That's $750. My guess is that you spent $3,600 to send people to Hawaii. Then you finally you support our school signs. Underneath that, it says sponsored by this. Scarborough B of E, I don't know if that was Board of Education, Benevolent Order of Elks, but if it was a Board of Education, were they really supposed to pay for those signs? Those signs don't come cheap. I don't think 
Board of Education should have been paying for it. I don't know if they did. I could be wrong. But they got to tighten up around here. This is crazy. I mean, for four years I'm chopping wood and nobody's listening. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Jolene Connor, I live at 121 Ash Swamp Road. I'm a lifelong resident of Scarborough and proud of it. And I applaud the council for attempting to keep a flat line budget because I agree with our predecessor speaker that there are many, many different things that have happened in this town where the budget has not been looked at appropriately and poor decisions have been made. Now, I don't really see the need to increase the school budget. You wanted to keep it flat line. You gave it to the school department to come back. Your Board of Education just rubber stamped it and pushed it through. It's now back in your hands. You had an original goal to keep it flat line. Now, with some of the budget situations like the gentleman just spoke about, we also have situations where you've given away furniture at the school when you could have, like any other business, used salvage value to get money back from that. We have no idea what you plan on doing with the kitchen equipment in the old school. All of that is money that could be plowed back into the school department in order to pay for things. I think there have been a whole bunch of very poor decisions made, and now you're asking us to throw more money at the school department so they can just blow it away. I'm sorry. We we do have a good school system. We have ways and smart people in place that can actually take a look at this budget and be very wise about how they're spending money efficiently. I don't think that you need to ask the municipal department to take a bigger percentage away from the them so as to pad to the school department. I think everybody owns their own budget and they need to keep it very, very tight and be responsible spenders. I don't think they're being responsible spenders here. We have said to you in a vote, we think it's too high, and we expect you to honor what we have requested of you. You said to us in the first place, you wanted a flat line, and I applaud you for that. Unfortunately, you have a school department and a school board who rubber stamped the wishes of the superintendent to give it back to you and make you look the bad guy. I don't think that's right. You were on the right track originally. Get your budgets in, in place. Make them efficient and effective to do the job you need to do with the money that you have. You do it in your own home budgets, do it here. Thank you very much. Thank you. Please, no applause. Good evening. My name is Melissa Anson. I live at One Haystack Circle. I'd like to speak for a moment in favor of the land bond application for Benjamin Farm that is later on tonight's agenda. I'm a member of the Board of Directors for Scarborough Land Trust. I'm also a neighbor who lives very close to Benjamin Farm along with hundreds of other Scarborough residents. We really have a fantastic opportunity here to protect a very important piece of land in our community, Benjamin Farm, and I would urge the town council to support this land bond application. I was born and raised in Scarborough, and I've lived here for my whole life with the exception of my four years of college. I really enjoyed growing up here in Scarborough, especially being outdoors. I appreciate it even more now, looking back at it today, because I realize that not every kid growing up has those opportunities. Scarborough is a great place to live, and I think a large part of that is due to the natural beauty and character. That's what makes Scarborough unique. When I think about Scarborough, I think of our wonderful beaches, the expansive Scarborough Marsh, our farming heritage, and the acres of forest. These resources make Scarborough a special place to live and greatly contribute to our quality of life here. We know that Scarborough residents value these resources too, because they have voted repeatedly and overwhelmingly in support of the Scarborough Land Bond. Even walking in here tonight, we're greeted with photos of the beautiful places here in Scarborough, the rich farming history. The town recently made a new website, and right on the front are photos of the, these landscapes in our town, showing how important they are to our character of the town. Benjamin Farm is the exact type of project that the land bond was created to support, and it fits perfectly into the vision that the town has charted in its latest comprehensive plan. 
I'm very excited about this project because of the whole suite of benefits it would provide to Scarborough residents, along with the numerous environmental benefits. Benjamin Farm is located in Pleasant Hill, the most densely populated part of Scarborough. So it will be easily accessible to hundreds of households, with many being able to walk there. Public trails will allow all types of recreational op opportunities, something that would enhance our community and that we just don't have in that part of town. As one of the younger people here, I'm mindful of development pressures. The town of Scarborough has grown immensely, even within my own lifetime. It can be easy to take our landscape for granted and just say to ourselves, wow, what a nice view as we drive by. But we have to realize that things don't always stay like this, and we've seen these changes in our town. We have to take action to ensure that the places that make Scarborough special remain for us, our children, and future generations. Benjamin Farm is one of those places, and I urge the town council to pass the land barn to secure public access to this land forever. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Jacqueline Durant, Hearthorn, 12 Stumberg Road. Well, I don't agree with cuts to education ever as an educator myself and a mother of three young children in the Scarborough school systems. Um, I'd like to talk more tonight about the perspective of what cuts were proposed um, and are being proposed. As an educator myself, I, as I said, I'm very concerned about the two vital academic programs um, that are being put on hold, um, according to what I read in Leader, um, that, to make the cuts that need to be made. Teachers need to meet Common Core standards. It's not something that they have a choice of doing. It's federally mandated for those people who don't know what Common Core is. Um, and is really meant to help us be um, more consistent across our United States. And that makes good sense to me as an educator and as a parent. Uh, all children need an academic continuum on um, which to build upon year after year. And that's in important to their education so they don't have gaps. Um, this is the Common Core attempting to do that across the United States, as I said. Um, I know that this year it was said that um, we don't have the money within the budget to support two really important endeavors, the reading program and the writing program. And that's just not something that we can afford to put on hold as an educator or as a parent. I'm really lucky that I'm an educator. I have the ability to teach my children what I, where I see gaps. And while we have had outstanding educators in Scarborough, there are gaps in reading and in writing with my children who are second, I have two second graders and, and a kindergartner this year. Um, it's my understanding that the new reading program is Kathy Collins' reading program. I love that program. I've been doing it for two years in my classroom. I know it well. There are ways to get around, maybe more cost-effective ways to get around and simply by putting it on hold, not providing it to our students, but perhaps teachers could be given, afford the opportunity to be given the book and read the book and talk among colleagues and talk to our curriculum coordinator and meet with our literacy specialists so that they can try to piece together the program instead of just putting the program on hold. It's doable. That's how I did it. Um, another program that I'm concerned about, um, too, is the writing program. And while Lucy Calkins, and perhaps you don't know who that is, she is the guru of reading and writing, certainly. She's expensive, too, and I get that. I understand that. There are other programs out there that could mimic her um, same kinds of teaching concepts, things like being a writer. Other districts are doing, and it is less costly than Lucy Calkins' program. Um, we have an outstanding math program. I'm thrilled to see what my children are doing in math. I don't teach that math program in the district in which I teach. I feel really lucky that my children have that opportunity. But before I would say, as a parent or an educator, we would put two really important programs on hold, I would say, let's look at something else that we can do instead of just saying we're not going to do this program this year. I'm not so sure that the budget's going to pass next year either. That concerns me. That certainly has happened in the district that I teach in. We can't afford to put programs on hold. We have to think creatively. And I hope that the town council hears this, and I hope that the school board hears this. I hope parents hear this. Don't put things on hold. Just get creative about if the, if the budget isn't going to pass, then we need to be, be thinking about what can we do to still make our education program grow. Thank you. Uh, I'm Dick Springer, 15 Piper Road, Apartment J313. First, I want to say that the Benjamin Farm, I think, provides uh, Scarborough with a great opportunity, and I strongly support uh, the, proposed, the proposed future plan for it. But I, I really want to talk about, or I, I shouldn't really have to emphasize the importance of high-quality education for children nowadays. I'm 84 years old. When I was young, you know, a strong back and a weak mind uh, would, would let people get along all right. That's not the way it is now. Uh, the way it is now, uh, a college graduate on average has twice the income of someone who does not finish college. And we have seen uh, 
incomes of, uh, uh, go down, and particularly at, at uh, lower levels, and uh, we don't want that to be the future of our children. They have to have a good education. Nickeling and diming the school system uh, is not the way to do it. There are vital programs that uh, it seems to be are being cut, and, it, and also the supposed extravagances that have been talked about by a couple of speakers here seem to me to be very small bore. Uh, another thing is that uh, there was an allusion to the cuts in uh, revenue sharing, which have been drastic and put the uh, town council and the school board in a hard situation. I would also mention the circuit breaker program. Now, when I was a homeowner uh, a, a few years back, I live in an apartment now, uh, the cutoff for the circuit breaker program was over $90,000. And I, in fact, got back something like $900 a year, which was uh, significant money. Now the program has been cut such that very few people qualify and the amounts of money they get are small. Uh, hopefully, a future administration in Augusta will return the circuit breaker program to, the, to what it was in the past. And, but meanwhile, I think we just have to bite the bullet and spend what it takes to provide a good education for the children who are in the school now. If we don't do it now, it'll be too late to do it for them sometime later. So I, and also the budget almost made it last time and uh, without a, a slash and burn, it, may, it, it has a good chance of making it this time. Keep the budget where it should be. Um, no applause, please. That's council rules. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I'm Adeline Allen. I live at uh, 7 Quadrant Lane, and I'm a fairly new resident to Scarborough, and this is about the school budget. Um, I would like everybody in the room, including the council members, to kind of look at your neighbor. Look at your neighbor, and don't be, please, can you do that? Ma'am, ma'am, okay. can you speak to the council, not the audience? Okay. Well, will council members please look at, <coughs> at each other? Look at the audience. There's a lot of gray hair in the audience. There's a lot of hair that is not gray. There's some very young children in the audience. I'm now going to talk about the, lo the lottery that you will win. We have to fund the schools. The golden years for many people are gray years. It is marred by chronic illnesses, disease, dementia, and Alzheimer's. One of the kids in our schools may have the answers. You can't not fund the school budget. The brains in our schools are the brains we need to nurture by giving them the tools they need. You have to fund the schools. The answer to so many illnesses may be hiding in our children's brains. You have to fund their tools. We can save ourselves, our children, our grandchildren, our children's grandchildren, children yet unborn, the action will cost us our lives and the ones we love because we did not nurture our answer, which is our children's future. Fund the schools. You can never give the schools too much money. Thank you. Um, sir, one moment. Um, it's been, you, you'll still have a chance to speak. Um, that ends the public uh, comment section. We're going to, Right, we just got a couple of things to do and we'll get right back at it so everybody can stay in line. It'll just take a couple of minutes because the next will be public hearing on the, on the uh, school budget. And then anybody that wants to talk about the Benjamin Farm, they'll be coming up again. You may speak to that. Um, but the question I have, is there anyone in the room that wants to talk about a different subject other than the school budget or Benjamin Farm here? Anyone? Okay, seeing none, I close the public hearing. Uh, and I'll be just, we'll get right back to you in a minute. Um, <clears throat> okay, uh, minutes of May 21st. Move for all. Second. Any errors or omissions? Seeing none, all those in favor? Opposed? Adjustments to the agenda. No. There are no adjustments to the agenda. Items to be signed, treasurer's warrants, I've already signed them. <coughs>
So next would be? Order number 1449 is the 6 p.m. public hearing and second reading on the proposed fiscal, fiscal year 2015 school budget. Okay, now we'll take any comment from the public on the school budget. Let me begin. Good evening. Uh, before I address my comments to the board, I just wanted a point of clarification with regard to the SOS signs that did appear in advance of that first vote. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> my name is Jeff Ertman of 15 Fairway Drive. Uh, with regard to the SOS signs, those were uh, not paid for by the school board or the Board of Education. They were endorsed by the Board of Education, but not one dime of that was paid for out of Board of Education funds. They were received as a gift, as a, as a private donor. Much of what I feel has either already been stated here this evening or will be expressed in the comments to come. I'll therefore be brief and allow others this platform. As has been pointed out, our local resources are pretty close to tapped, which is why the importance of ensuring that Augusta lives up to its pledge of support for education as being critical. This support is needed through the bolstering of existing infrastructure of public education. Many here in this room are probably products of the public schools. My high school education laid the groundwork to allow me to continue my education, and today's kids deserve no less than what we had. We run the risk of losing the quality of this basic right. Yes, Scarborough High School was recently ranked number 10 in the state of Maine, but did you know that this rank was number seven in 2011 and number six in 2010? This downward trend is unacceptable and needs to be reversed before it is too late. Make the investment in the schools now before it's too late. Lastly, this time of year is always a difficult one with so much going on in all of our lives, yet it seems that each year we arrive at this critical juncture with the need for support of the budget process. I am making a pledge to support the process by voicing the need for adequate funding in the schools before it has been voted on the first time. I would ask each of you here this evening to make a similar pledge and encourage your fellow citizens to vote. The turnout in May was far too low. We can avoid the need to be here in June on the night of baccalaureate, no less, by passing a properly funded budget the first time. Thanks for your time and consideration. Thank you. Once again, I'll say three, mi go ahead. three minutes and name and address. Good evening, my name is Margaret Pitts and I live at 4 Turnberry Circle. Ten years ago, my husband was transferred to Maine. I grew up in Arkansas and we were living in Texas at the time. I knew no one in Maine and I knew nothing about Maine. So having about to be finishing my 25th year in education, I started researching schools. And I chose Scarborough. It's a place where I wanted my family to live. My son graduated from Scarborough High School four years ago and my daughter will be a senior next year. I cannot express enough the importance of the funding for schools. Our students have won more state championships than I think any other high school in the state. And since sports isn't always the most important thing, they've also, I think, won the most academic decathlons as any other high school in the state. In the district I'm in, we prepared something for our town council with the U.S. News top 20 main high schools. Scarborough was ranked number 10. Yet out of all the high schools listed, we spend far less than everybody else on education. My daughter's almost done. So my message is for the parents. Please be invested. I know lives are busy because my life is busy. Please be vested in your students' education. Please vote. And most importantly, thank you to the staff of the Scarborough School Department for doing more with less on a daily basis and, what, and do the best they can for kids every day. Thank you. Hello, I'm Julie Muller from 2 Ottawa Woods Road. Our family moved to Scarborough eight years ago. We chose this town primarily because of the excellent schools. The test scores were good, but also they were teaching Mandarin at Wentworth. There was an annual art show for all the students in the district, and art and music were required through eighth grade. 
Unfortunately, all of these wonderful attributes are gone now. There are other good programs like access to technology, but the things that made Scarborough stand out um, from other schools are gone due to budget cuts. Next year, my daughter in seventh grade might only have language during her short homeroom period, and she's devastated that there's no art class in eighth grade. I believe this will do our students a disservice when they leave Scarborough to compete with others in college and in the business world. When I hear seniors in the community complain that we spend more on the schools than on them, I believe they are lucky that there's no annual referendum on the amount the town pays for other programs. We don't vote on the library, we don't vote on senior services, we don't vote on community services or safety, we only vote on the school budget. For example, the budget for senior programs saw an increase of 6.8% since last year, yet I don't hear any complaints about that. I understand that people are concerned about their increasing tax bills, however I would point out to them that this anger should be directed at the state legislature and the governor, not at our children. The loss of state revenue sharing is primarily to blame for the increase. I teach political science at Southern Maine Community College, and in class we talk about public goods. Those are the things that government supplies for all of the citizens' benefits. There are many public goods, like police, roads, a library, and schools. Unfortunately, there are always limited funds to pay for these public goods. Clearly, safety must come first, but second has to be education. Libraries, parks, and senior activities are all extras that make our town a better place to live, and I encourage spending on them. However, providing education should be an essential job of government, and that education should make our children informed and well-rounded future citizens and leaders in our community. And I would add a note that those students and teachers went to Hawaii because they had won the state academic decathlon competition. And that's something that should be celebrated and not discouraged. Thank you. Thank you. Robert, excuse me, my name is Robert Rovner. I live at 4 King Street. I'm confused. I'm really confused. I thought that $40 million uh, was a lot of money, but I must be wrong because you listen to everybody here tonight and they're saying the schools aren't being funded. Programs aren't being funded. We shouldn't be shaving anything. We're not shaving anything at all. The fact of the matter is the only thing being shaved is the increase that the Board of Education presented to the council when the council asked them to come in flat. That's what they're shaving. You're guaranteed last year's budget for, plus an additional $6.1 million from the state, and it's not enough. So you came back, and your expenditures have increased by 7.2%, and this is what you present to the council. Now, in January, I was at the council workshop, and whatever counselors were present vowed to keep the budget flat. Only two of you folks, excuse me, you counselors have, have done that and steadfastly done it. 28%. That means there's what? 72% of you have just been thumbed by the nose by the, by the Board of Education and eaten it. And now we're trying to get back to something that everybody can live with. The one thing about tonight and the one thing about this whole process and the way this town is structured is that tonight allows the council to regain its strength and its power and its leadership for the public. And that's what I'm asking you to do. I'm asking you to try and make the Board of Education understand that they are not autonomous, that we, the public, pay for this. We, the public, when 29.5 4% of the households in this town have a senior citizen over 65, many of whom live on a fixed income and can't afford it, are being hit. That's unconscionable. And I don't get it. And that needs great consideration. So if you would like to protect all the people that you serve in this town, 
I urge this. I urge that we go back to the budget that was passed last year and we start from scratch. Now, $138,000 still leaves the school board with a 7.2% increase in expenditures. It's nothing. They need to come down or you need to set a budget tonight that is far from their expectation. And then maybe they can negotiate something. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Good evening. Jacqueline Perry, 215 Black Point Road, and I am a member of the Board of Education and proud to say so. I thank you for changing the time so that we on the board could be here and members of our faculty as well because there is a baccalaureate uh, service as part of commencement for our high school seniors at St. Max at 7.30. And no, that is not an event sponsored by the school department. I also want you to keep in mind that our parents and businesses in this town contribute a, a well, a, we think around $500,000, think about it, to the school department for activities and athletics. School department does not buy the jackets that say championship soccer team. Parents do that. The only fundraising that we have done is we've required the students to pay a fee to participate and a parking fee, which I absolutely hate, and so do they and everybody else. The council does have the opportunity to raise monies. The school department does not beyond what I just stated. I ask that you not reduce the school budget beyond the current bottom line, which in my opinion is a little low. Here are some facts that I know about. I bought my house in 1970. I paid $13,500 for it on Black Point Road. It is assessed by this town at the present time at around $185,000. I hope that when I no longer live there that it will be selling for around $185,000 and not thirteen five. dollars My sister will gain the profits. <laughs> My income today as a senior citizen and a retiree is one-eighth of what the value of my house is. I would hope that it, I would hope for those on the council who are about my age, and I ask you, do you expect to fight for the best possible education for our children as you did for your own? That is what I am fighting for here and now, what it costs to educate our children today, not what it costs for you to educate your children. 185 versus 13.5. What is your house worth? What is the education of our children worth? Please do not let the ease of retirement to this beautiful community of Scarborough, Maine get in the way of educating our children. They are our future. And I thank you. Thank you. Doug Friedman, 17 Lillian Way. Um, I wanted to say a few facts first, and then a few comments, and then a suggestion. Firstly, the few facts, I went to the main Department of Education website, and I pulled the data that they have for um, the year ended uh, 2013, so a year ago. It provides the amount of money spent by every one of the SADs in Maine, of which we are one of the 225 in Maine, and it shows the amounts per pupil of each of the SADs. And I just want to give you some idea of where we stand relative to all the other SADs in Maine. We are number eight in terms of the net operating costs, dollars in total that is spent by a community. We are number nine in population in terms of number of students. We have 3,200 students, plus or minus, this is a year ago, and it's 
um, the, the calculation methodology. So we spend about, and this, is, this does not include debt service, it does not include transportation, it does not include some administrative costs, but we spend about $9,600 a year on a student. That's as opposed to the state average, which is a little over 10000 I looked at the, there are 65 school systems in Maine with over 1,000 students. Bear in mind, we have 3,000. But there are 65 with over 1,000 students, and we are right in the middle of the expenditure per, per student. So we are number 33 out of 65. I then looked at a couple of other people talked about the U.S. News and World Report um, uh, article that came out a month or two ago saying that Scarborough is the 10th, according to their reporting, is the 10th best high school in the state. So I looked at the other municipalities. What are they, who are they? Falmouth, Yarmouth, Cape Elizabeth, Kennebunk, Wells, York, Camden Hills, and Orono, and Maine School of Math and Science, much, much smaller school. How much do they spend per pupil? I mean, we aspire to the best. Can we afford it? Probably not, but can we afford more than we're spending? Maybe so. The average of all those schools, remember, we're $9,600 per student, is 11,700 per student that much more than us. The lowest of all of those, which is Falmouth, is about 10900 so $1,000 more per student. How much more would it cost us to get to that level? That would cost us $4 million more than what, we're spend, what we spent a year ago. So th these, are, these are the numbers that we want to aspire to, but the question is, can we as a community afford that now or to get there? So those are a few facts. A couple of comments. Uh, dollars are not everything. Our teachers, our school board, our administration has done an astonishing job given the comparison to our peers and how much we're spending. Just give me two minutes more, sorry. Um, I went to the student awards night last night, and I don't know if any of you went to that. It lists out all the graduating seniors, what they're doing next year, and I noticed at least two of the students are going to Ivy League schools. Many are going to private schools. A lot are going to public schools. We have kids going into the trades. We have kids going to sports and kids going to work, and some that have gap years and don't know. But our school prepares for all of those things, and we need to remember that. Um, one thing I would say, or a, last thing I want to say is a suggestion to the superintendent, and that is I work in a very large business, and we do budgeting every year. But we also do something called a medium-term outlook, where you project beyond one year, project out three to five years. Tell us what you want to spend ultimately, and then let's look at how do we get there in a way that doesn't dramatically change our mill rate or our taxable amount we have to pay on a year-by-year basis, or else every year we're going to stand here. So, okay, thank you. Thank you. Good evening, uh, Corey Fellows, 36 Orchard Street. Um, my son Charlie is back there somewhere in the back trying to finish his homework. I have two other boys in the schools. Um, I'll try to be brief. I just want to speak very briefly about sort of the, the process and some of the um, some of the uh, sort of the, the climate around this process. I think we could all agree that it's an imperfect process. Um, most things involving some form of democracy are. Um, but it, it does bother me when I hear people write in the newspaper or get up here and, and sort of disparage entire parts of our, our local town government. Uh, the school board is not some they. It's a, it's, a, it's a body that's elected by us, just like you are as counselors. <coughs> um, and it's my, my understanding and my belief anyway that, that you as counselors and the school board, uh, along with others, have really worked in good faith, um, having been dealt a pretty tough hand, as has been pointed out, due to the, the, uh, the state aid cuts, to try and hold the line. And I understand that there was a goal to keep the budget flat. Uh, it's one thing to say that you want something. It's quite another to be able to achieve it. I mean, I'd like, to, I'd like it to be warmer than 55 degrees on June 4th, but it's not that simple. Um, so I just, I just want to... Uh, I guess mostly express my appreciation for all the hard work that's been done. Um, I do support this budget. I, think it's, I do think it's too small for a lot of the reasons um, and based on a lot of the actual facts that have been cited already. Um, I serve on a different town board and I know that it, it, it's, a, it's a big commitment 
it can be a thankless job, more so for for you counselors and, and school board members who have to answer to voters. Um, but uh, I hope we can all sort of keep uh, keep sight of that, uh, that these are people working in good faith to try and try and uh, uh, create a, a budget and ensure a quality uh, education and and uh, quality of life for the, for the whole town. So thank you very much. Thank you. Hi, my name is William Bly. I reside at 10 Ottawa Woods Road. And uh, it seems like Groundhog Day here every year. Just keep coming back over the same battle over what? School board budget. And I have to say uh, it's frustrating and disheartening to see so much polarization in our community over this one topic. And I think a lot of people have expressed good views on both sides of the fence. The retirees have very legitimate concerns, but so do the parents. And I can tell you my personal experience is I moved here close to seven years ago, and we picked this town because somewhere in 2006, 2007, Scarborough High School was ranked number four in the state, only behind Cumberland High School, Cape Elizabeth and Falmouth. As we all know, we've fallen really far behind, and the programs I thought were available to my child, who will be 10 this summer, are no longer available. Uh, the arts programs have been cut back so dramatically. Uh, we have one music teacher for the entire Wentworth school. Uh, my child gets music, I think, once a week, once every two weeks. He gets art, and that will decrease as he goes up in level where this, where the uh, education values seem to be strictly related to the core sciences and mathematics. And I think as a society, not just here in Scarborough, we've really gotten away from the importance of an arts education. And the languages uh, that have been cut back <clears throat> and the opportunity for these children to engage in uh, foreign languages are gone. Those opportunities are gone. And, and all of that, I think, you can't point to one single reason, but I think you can look at all of that and say, these might be reasons for why Scarborough High School or Scarborough school systems are slipping. And I think there's one thing that most of us have in common, whether we're retired or we have children, and that is, for the majority of us that live here, uh, our biggest investment is our home and our home value. And what brings the biggest return on our home value generally are people moving into a desirable neighborhood, moving into a desirable community, and Scarborough has always been that way, but it seems like we're slipping away from that. And as people begin to set their sights on different towns, Falmouth, Cape Elizabeth, they continue to rise to the top while Scarborough continues to fall, I think you will see uh, your property values begin to slip. You will not see the returns on your investment for your homes. And if that is, like it is for most of us, our biggest return of our financial investment for our retirement, I think it is a very short-sighted strategy to be cutting this budget. Uh, I would just ask you to take in consideration the best interests in this town as a town as a whole without looking at separate interests really is the retention of our property values. Forget about the school issue. Forget about the retiree issues. Can't afford it. Ultimately, it's the property values in this town. And if people don't have confidence in our school system and continue to watch those rankings drop, they're going to move to different communities, and you will see a shift in those property values. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, I'm uh, Doug Bennett, 32 Tall Pines Road. I'm here to ask you to avoid cutting any more, mo any more money from our, our budget toward the schools. I'm also asking you to create some kind of plan to restore our schools to where we were a few years ago. This issue is going to come up every year again and again and again and divide our town deeper and deeper and deeper. So you have a plan uh, that will help both sides, that will make both sides happy when we go to the vote. Um, the tax increases we've seen in the last few years have been, uh, have been a lot. But it stems from the cuts from the state level. It's not the schools out of control spending. It's not the schools doing anything fancy and crazy. But the millions and millions of dollars that have been lost from state spending that the town of Scarborough was supposed to pick up or the state was supposed to help out later on. Neither has happened for whatever reason. But I think we need to come up with a plan that will restore the schools to where they were a few years ago. Um, Lost my place. Um, even if it means, sorry, excuse me. Even if it means we need to start cutting some money from the municipal side. I feel that uh, the schools seem to be the ones that are constantly in the microscope. They seem to be the scapegoat for all the budget problems in this town. Right now, I don't say the down there to the word school on public like we whisper it around. Like I, I, I'm a school teacher. I work at the schools. 
we call the school, and we think the school budget, because you don't know who the other person is or how they can react to it. So it's like this fall of the word for people who can't count the, can't count the six. Um, Um, and what we usually do, I think, is towns celebrating the schools. I mean, schools, uh, the, what we have with all the low spending we've heard about and the preferred people spending, all this stuff, the school system is an example of fiscal responsibility. And that should be celebrated, not facing more cuts. Cuts that won't improve our school, won't push our school forward in 2014. Schools that keep pushing us further and further behind uh, area, area schools. So I'm really encouraging to plead over the next couple of years, two to three years, make a plan, restore our schools to where they once were, um, or we're going to see this issue in the Vire Town even further and further than it already is. Uh, thank you very much for your time. My name is Michelle Urban. I reside at 9 Colton Farms Road. I spoke two weeks ago, and I recently sent an email to all the town councilors, so this is my third time communicating my thoughts to you. Why am I here a third time? Well, I have three children, so I guess I get to um, communicate once for each of them. Over the past several years, Augusta lawmakers have made the decision to shift the responsibility of funding public education from the state level to the local level. As said before, this translated to a 32.4% decrease in state funding of our school budget over the last six years. When state funding continues to decline, combined with the annual increase in fixed costs, how can we expect school board members to submit a flat budget while still advocate for the educational needs of our students? That would be irresponsible, in my opinion. Had the school board met the town council's flat budget request, there would have been significant cuts directly impacting our students' daily academic environment. As a parent, my job is to advocate for my three children. I wouldn't be doing my job if I didn't stand before you tonight and share my thoughts, and certainly the school board would not have been doing their job had they submitted a flat budget. Unfortunately, a responsible and properly funded school budget means that funding needs to come from taxpayers and other creative resources. As a town, we've already implemented these creative funding resources with activity and sports fees in grades 3 through 12, $75 for my daughter to play middle school field hockey, $25 for my son to participate in Lego robotics at Wentworth. Parking fees at the high school and the variety of ways that parents voluntarily supplement their child's education through Scarborough Education Foundation fundraising, purchasing classroom supplies with their own money, and countless volunteer hours in our schools. Yes, there have been tax increases too. I don't like to pay taxes. However, sometimes we need to make those tough choices and decide that public education is worth funding appropriately and responsibly. Because we haven't recovered from the significant educational cuts experienced in recent years, we continue to ask our students to learn in classroom environments that have too many students with a wide range of academic abilities and needs as well as a growing student population with significant psychosocial and physical health needs. We expect teachers to work and students to learn in environments with inadequate, inadequate supplies, staffing, and educational programming. However, the public expectation remains that our schools will continue to earn those A and B state report cards. Whatever you may think of these grades, they do matter to people. And we expect to maintain the good school reputation which helps attract new homeowners and businesses to our community. More importantly, the expectation remains that our students will be prepared for the growing technologic and global demands of our society. I'm not sure how this will happen with our current lack of funding at state and town levels. Thank you to the school board for their incredible efforts. Thank you to the town council for respectfully listening to all opinions expressed about this issue and maintaining an open mind. As adult community members, it is our responsibility to properly fund public education. No one likes tax increases, but sometimes the end does justify the means, and I ask that you please approve the school budget. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Jody Shea. I live at 23 Windsor Pines Drive. I'm also on the school board and proud to say that. Uh, most of you know where I stand on this issue. I feel strongly that this community has elected its officials to do specific jobs. One of our jobs as, as school board members is to present you with what we think, after much discussion and reworking, a sensible budget. We have done that. The voters disagreed with our first budget, so we came to you with a budget that has been reduced further. It is now time for you to send that budget back to the voters and find out what they think. My biggest frustration of the past couple of weeks has been the misinformation and the idea that people continue to spread this information as fact blows my mind. 
um, it does complete disservice to everyone involved. It, it's a disservice to the school board and the town council have worked endlessly to create this budget. It does a disservice to the, the voters who need to know the facts before they go out and vote, and it does a disservice to our students. We as a community are better than that. This is a fantastic place to live and raise a family, and no one wants their taxes raised. We're all taxpayers in this town, and we're doing the best, our best to serve our students in our schools while working to keep overall tax impact low. We hear, people, we hear people when they say that they will have to move if their taxes get any higher. I absolutely get that. I get it. I'll have to move if this town continues to not fund education. It's the same thing. We are not asking for extravagant things in this budget. We're looking to maintain a good system. Our staff is working creatively to provide strong education for students with a lot less. So some of the misinformation that I've heard over the last couple of weeks that I wanted to clarify here tonight so everyone was well aware of it. First one, the guidance category shows an increase of 57.62%. That's an awful lot of staff being added. Maybe the schools should cut there. The fact is, Social workers have been, always been budgeted in special services, but in the past few years with the explosion of 504 cases and other student needs, more and more of their time is spent with regular ed students to ensure that they are accurately reported. The service costs, we have shifted 50% of the salary and benefit costs to each existing social worker in the guidance category, which is where the state accounting system records regular ed social work. The special education budget category is down 1.5% from last year. When you look at both categories, the total increase over last year is 4.65%. Um, important fact to understand is the current caseload for a Scarborough guidance counselor at the high school is approximately 350 students per guidance counselor. The Maine Department of Ed recommends 250 students. The next myth. School budgets have been going up unreasonably in the past several years. The fact is, actually, the increase in the school department's expenditure budget has gone up an average of 3.48% per year since fiscal year 2009. Unfortunately, non-tax revenues from the state have declined by 32.4% in that same period, forcing local taxpayers to pick up the slack. And the last one that I will quickly go through is uh, the school department is giving away a bunch of perfectly good furnishings from the old Wentworth to, to third world countries so they can buy all new stuff. It's simply not true. The fact is the building committee has worked with salvage and repurposed hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of materials, furnishings, and equipment from the old Wentworth to reuse in the new building acro and across the district. Other items that that still have some value are being sold to offset costs and donated to Ruth's reusables. Tables, desks, and chairs that are 23 years old have been donated to Partners of World Health for shipment overseas. This furniture was not accepted by other school districts to purchase because of age and condition. The cost of resale exceeded the value of the furniture. So Partners of World Health will remove, store, and ship at no cost to us. The, the, something came up tonight, the ki kitchen equipment from the old school. All of that is going to the new school. Um, I, I have to stop. Okay, here. Bye. It's been Thank four you. minutes now. Thank you. Sorry. Next. Hi, I'm Stacy Newman. I live at 20 Windsor Pines Drive. Uh, I um, am a mother of three young children, none of which are in the school system yet. We moved to Scarborough approximately five years ago for my husband's job, and I have to confess, I feel somewhat betrayed by what we were told when we moved here. Um, we were told that Scarborough has an excellent school system, and that is the only reason that we picked to move to Scarborough. Um, it does have an excellent school system, but when we moved here, it was ranked fifth or sixth. Then it went to seventh, and now it's at tenth. And my kids haven't begun school yet. And I fear that by the time they get into school, it'll be 15, 20, 25, 30. 10 is excellent, but we wouldn't be saying about our sports teams, oh great, they came in 10th. We deserve better for our children. Something else I am speaking about because I, as we were listening to and I realized I have some insight into it is I'm presently selling, we're presently selling the house we moved to and the plan is to stay in Scarborough, although I, I question that unfortunately with these budgets. But we've had a lot of feedback on our house, it's mainly um, families with young children coming to move, and dozens of families have chosen to go to another school district. That's the feedback we've gotten. 
City of Lake Scarborough, but they're concerned about the drop in the rankings. Another thing is we looked into building and we spoke to the builder, and he said, just in conversation, interestingly, I'm building some houses in an adjacent town, and the, the property, the, the housing costs in Scarborough is at an increase just because of the Scarborough level. But, he said, that increase is much less than it has been in past years. Now, I don't know if that's related to the school budget, but it seems to me too big of a coincidence. Everyone knows that the, the school system is the number one reason people move to a town and the number one reason for property values to be retained and increased. Again, it benefits all of us for a good school system. I don't expect you to personally care about my children's education as much as I do, but we all have to care about all of our children's education. The so school board, as elected officials, have worked tirelessly to come up with this new budget and ask you to support it. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Jane Ng, Nevin Abigail Way. I'm a member of the school board and also serve on the school board finance committee. <coughs> Unlike last year, when I frequently appear before some of you during the budget season, I have been quiet this year. Because the school board as a town council have worked co pretty closely, and I had a lot of faith in you to pass a budget that balance the needs of the children and the consideration for the seniors in town. As a mother and the taxpayers, balance is always on my mind. During my campaign last year, I locked on over a thousand doors and talk with voters of different walk of life and ages. I'm keenly aware of the need to keep our school running efficiently and make financial choices prudently. When one parent asks me to make a choice, which one I would do first, fight for efficiency or fight for more money? I unequivocally told him I would fight for efficiency first before I fight for money. Even as a school board member, with my duty to think of the children first, I still think that was a good, right choice. I have kept and followed through my principle and worked closely with the school leadership and finance committee to scrutinize and prioritize our school program needs. Even though I felt the first budget passed by the town council was too low, I accepted in the spirit of understanding and compromise. Very unfortunately, the budget didn't pass. The school board took another bite as a budget. The current proposed budget with another $138,000 cut is going to hurt our school district, leaving one that will take years to recover. We are off the balance that's fair for our children. We owe our obligation to educate. I cannot bear to see any disregard for our children's needs anymore. As a school district, can we do things differently and better? That's a question all of us involved are asking all the time. Any initiative will need to be looked at carefully and responsibly. But any more forced reduction to the school budget is going to undermine the school district commitment to quality education. And I strongly urge you not to take that course. I still hold the faith in you to make the right choice. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good evening, my name is Lisa Douglas. I live at 3 Mayflower Drive, and I'm a teacher here in Scarborough at one of our primary schools. Um, I wasn't planning on speaking tonight, so I apologize. This might be a little choppy. Um, but walking in and seeing one of my past students curled up on the floor out there reading a book, mm -hmm. listening to what was going on, flipped my whole evening plan upside down. A um, couple things I want to say. Um, the schools are doing an amazing job, and it has nothing to do with the fact that I'm here. I've got children that are, two children that are juniors this year, and they have received a wonderful education that I'm very proud to be a part of. That's the first piece. Second piece is that as I try and teach my first graders when they have all the I want, I want, I want list, um, there's a difference between an I want list and an I need list, because we can only do so many wants at a time. And the wants that you have, you've got to be able to support some of those on your own. It can't be what you want on the back of everybody else. Um, in saying that, I'm thinking about the seniors of our community. I don't think it's fair to keep pushing people in our town 
out of our town because we keep driving up our tax rate. Now, am I saying I want a lower budget? No. Um, what I'm saying is I want the best town we can have for the money that we can afford. If we feel that one area of our town needs our attention that's running a deficit to our community as a whole because of what it will give us back in payment back in the future, then I think we need to concentrate our efforts there. If I'm teaching a student, I have 15 things to teach them, but I've got to prioritize what's the most impacting piece right then and right there to help the rest fall into place. And I think in my opinion, that's not something that we're doing as a town. Is a new beach house nice? Sure is. Do we need it? No, we don't. Not if we're saying, eh, we really think our kids all need more technology, but we can't afford it and we don't want to put that financial piece on the back of our taxpayers. We shouldn't have to. We shouldn't have a sidewalk to nowhere that we then have to buy a new machine to plow, a new machine to cut the little strip of gas. We now have a road that is also too narrow for two buses to pass in the same lane going the same way. I don't know what happened there. Why do we do that? I have never seen one person on that sidewalk, but it costs thousands and thousands of dollars that we could have put into a place to get more payback. So I'm encouraging us hugely, please do not cut this school budget because the schools need to raise up, modernize in certain areas that will give us the best yield. That to me is smart spending. I'm asking the town to take a look at what we're spending. I love land trusts. I heard the signal, thank you, I'll be done in just a second. Um, I love the land trust ideas, but maybe we need to put our hiatus on a couple things for a couple years. Put our monies in other places. We've got one purse, one amount of money in it. How are we going to spend it? We can't have it all. Let's not teach our children that the big thing to do every year is try and have it all. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, no applause, please. Thank you. Hi there. I'm Lawrence Pierce, 910 Lane in Scarborough. It seems to me I've come here three or four times previously and advocated for the school budget. <clears throat> I am a senior citizen, I'm a member of the public, and I'm a taxpayer. Each time I've come and advocated for it, about six months later I saw my tax bill and it went up. But that's life. I think that to reduce the school budget, would be an egregious mistake. Because of things that are going on at Augusta, we should not put our school system on life support. It's an important component of the community, and I would advocate for no reduction. In fact, I advocated for an increase in the budget, the school budget. Thank you. Thank you. Next. Good evening. My name is Chris Taylor. I live at 168 Black Point Road, and um, I work in a middle school and a high school every day, and uh, it's one of these high-performing school districts. We talked about the ones, if we're number 10, it's one of the, <clears throat> one of the higher ones. And because of that, I kind of have an interesting uh, communication problem with my wife. Um, you know, it's kind of normal to say, how was your day, and what happened today, and so it's, you know, good day, but... Um, I've made the mistake a couple times now, well, it's probably just been too many times of saying, God, you should have seen what the kids were doing today. Whether it was the music coming out of the auditorium, the artwork on the walls, or art portfolios, science, technology, engineering courses, the number of guidance counselors um, and school um, personnel, the amount of uh, special education staff. I've got three kids in our school, and I've got a daughter that's going to be in ninth grade. Um, so hearing other people talk tonight, I wasn't going to talk. I don't, I don't know if I was going to talk, but I'm up here, so obviously I am. Um, my daughter's going to be in ninth grade, and as Mr. Ertman and other people talked about schools, nine, eight, seven, whatever, being ahead of us, I started just doing a little calculation that, well, say there's, I think in the high school where I work, we have about 750 kids, and if say, say there were 200 or 150 seniors, well, if I said 200 seniors times nine, that'd be 1,800 kids. 
um, alone that my daughter would quote unquote be competing against when she's a senior uh, for college application. And that doesn't include, of course, all the other hundreds, if not thousands, of kids in Maine that she's going to be competing with. And let's be honest here, this is Maine. We are heavily competing against Maine, I mean, excuse me, Massachusetts or New York. Um, any of us that have kids in uh, soccer programs or sports programs know we do great here and we get our, um, we, we have trouble with uh, other states. So uh, I think the same goes for education. Massachusetts and some of these other states, highly competitive. And so m my kids will be competing against them. And I, I know it's always hard to say competing and keeping up with these other towns, but that is the reality. Uh, we are uh, based on capitalism here. We are based on competition, and it's no different with college. And so I have to look at that and see what my daughter's going to be prepared for. My, I got three kids, so but she's my oldest, so I'm thinking about her. I only got four years of high school, where she's going to stand when she's a senior, uh, in comparison to kids from other schools who have had much more um, experience and a richer experience. So um, I think we have to make a decision about are we a good school district or are we an excellent school district? And I've heard both words used tonight, so I hope that we go forward as an excellent school, um, not only in name but in commitment from our town. Thank you. Thank you. Next. My name is Dave Green and I live at 135 Beach Ridge Road. I'm down here for my annual point the finger at the town council. I do this every year. I keep hearing about how the school budget's cut, cut, cut. They got more money every year than they had the previous year. Every year. Show me one penny that's been cut out of that school budget. Please. Just show me where. And I have a good answer for that. If the people don't think that their kids are going to get a good education for the $43 million that we're spending, then it's time for a new school board and a new superintendent. Because they can all get out their checkbook, just like I got mine right here, and they can write a check and make a donation. But don't ask me to raise my taxes to the percentage that you're exceeding. It's unsustainable. It's unsustainable, these increases. We cannot continue the route. The town is going to go down the tubes. And believe it or not, finally, finally, there's a taxpayer revolt going on in this town. And it's coming. And it'll show up at the polls and the voting booths, believe me. So I implore you, please, $138,000 that the school committee took out of that budget is a slap in the face to the people of this town. Thank you. Next. Kristen Schuler, 29 Glendale Circle. Um, just like Mrs. Douglas, I didn't expect to speak tonight, but now I need to. <laughs> I'm an educator as well, not in Scarborough, um, but I'm an educator and teachers are doing the best they can with what they have and with what they lose every year. They put their own personal money into it, they put their own personal time into it. I agree with everything that's been said in support of the budget. Maybe if we could vote on the town council budget, things would be a little different. Um, a pretty yet crazy expensive intersection at Hagas Parkway won't attract people to Scarborough. Education will. The school board did not rubber stamp the budget. They work very hard and they aren't asking for anything but to maintain the programs we have and to try and bring back ones we've lost. Nothing new. I thank the school board and the town council and the administration. You guys kick butt. You're awesome. We've got to keep it up though and we're not. So shame on the citizens that did not vote in May. We should not be here right now. This should be a mute point. Um, I'm asking the town council to do something crazy, not only agree to the budget, but maybe put some money back in so that we can do what we need to do for the kids of Scarborough. Thank you. Thank you. Donna Bealy, Gunsock Road. I'm on the school board. I see some similarities to the position that the council's put in to my job as an administrator in the schools in the past. And that is that you only hear from people when they're angry. That's when they come out. What I used to like to do is listen to them and meet with them face to face. And what I often found out is that they had inaccurate information. And I appreciated the chance to speak with them and clarify 
that inaccurate information. And that often helped quite a bit. I think we're going to have to work together a little bit better to make sure that what we're putting out there when we do our board meetings, when we talk to the newspapers, that the information we say on both sides is the same. I have to speak to the issue of the insinuation that the seniors in this town can't afford to pay taxes. I'm one of those seniors on a fixed income. I can pay my taxes, and I know of quite a few neighbors and friends my age who can pay their taxes. So I'm tired of feeling embarrassed that I might be a senior in this town because I can't afford my taxes. All the board is asking for is a gradual, incremental increase. That is what we are asking. We are trying to recoup from the loss of 41 positions in the 10-11 calendar year. We want a gradual improvement in our schools. We need the positions we're asking for because what we have ahead of us is much more than this. We need to be talking to the community about Common Core, about proficiency testing, and a whole host of things that are coming down the line that is, we can't talk to you about that are really significant and transformative in education. But we can't get there because we're still talking about taking middle school kids out of study halls and giving them art. These issues should have been handled years ago. We shouldn't have to come in front of you for those kinds of simple things. We have bigger fish to fry. What I'm wondering is just how many thousands of dollars do you think we need to come down for the lack of 157 votes? That's the question before you tonight. I value the time and the effort you put in, and I appreciate your listening to all of the people responding tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Next. <clears throat> Short story, Martin Tripp. I tried to go, and I went, and I looked at the shot putters and the discus throwers. This may seem silly, but there was a definite need, and I was good at it. So I was going to talk to them at the high school level, and I found out that I had to be fingerprinted, that I had to take a CPR class, that I had to be accepted by the coaches. It cost me $200 to try to help these kids. They were moving in ways that could injure themselves. They were throwing in fashion that could never work. Their discus pit was and is in a dangerous location that I'm, I'm scared that somebody's going to take one right between the eyes. It's possible, and that's too close to me. So I was told, well, we don't need you. So rather than talk to the high school people, I went down to the grade school people. And I talked to the guy, and he said, the coaches down there, they don't need me either. I was willing to give of my time and my effort to try to address safety issues and have these kids reflect on how they move and work around what could potentially be a dangerous situation. What's my point? People that aren't here and aren't in favor of some of the budget issues are not saying they don't want the best schools we can get. We want an input so that the schools can be improved at a reasonable cost to everybody. So don't disparage the people that want better performance by all the school board and the departments. These people want a better Scarborough. They don't want reductions. They want this town to work. I was willing, I put in three days just running around getting fingerprinted. I'm no criminal. I got one speeding ticket in 30 years. 
I wish you'd really reflect and say these people really are concerned. That's all I got to say. Thank you. Anyone else? I'll be very brief. My name is Robert Rovner. Um, one of my fellow... Um, can we can we keep it quiet and hear the gentleman's trying to speak? One one of my fellow citizens just stated that how much does the council have to come down to get the 157 votes they need? I sat here and listened to all these meetings with the with the board of ed, and the question from the finance director of the board of ed wasn't a question. He was said let's let the people vote. They slapped us all in the face by not heeding or working with the council's request to come in flat. And I think it's reasonable to assume that they couldn't come in flat, but they didn't need to show an increase of in, in expenditures of 7.2%. They are going to, um, and that's where my rub comes. My rub comes with, this is not a matter that people don't want education or people are not in favor of education. What they're in favor of is something that's fair to everybody. And because the people are paying for it, and because in this state it's required that the people vote on it, it's only fair that the people have a complete understanding of the budget line by line and what they're doing. That seems to be a miss. It won't be a miss in the future. This I'm going to guarantee you right now. But right now, we're faced with something else. And I would hope that along with Mr. Blaze and Mr. Benedict, that others on the council will see fit to try and bring this budget into some sort of order that the entire town can live with. It's not a matter of getting 157 more votes. It is a matter of what is fair to this community for everyone. And it is the responsibility of this council to be fair and just to everybody that lives here. Thank you. Thank you. Before I close the uh, public hearing, is there anyone else <laughs> who would like to speak? Please come up, because I'm going to be closing it soon. Kelly Murphy, 5 Woodfield Drive, and also a member of the Board of Education. Um, <clears throat> I obviously would recommend that you accept the budget as presented by the school board at your first reading. Um, I, and I know the rest of the board, take great personal offense when we hear things about the school board operating um, underhandedly or somehow for personal gain. If that's the case, I am certainly doing it wrong. Um, I have served on the school board for three years at great personal and financial cost. So um, I completely disagree with that characterization. We have been very open and transparent as we have been every year with the school budget. We meet in public. No one comes to our meetings. We talk at length for hours and hours about programs that are being proposed for new budgets, for the new budget. We talk at length about details of the budget. It's been discussed that people want to see line by line. That is all available on the town, on the town website. It's available when we discuss meetings, um, our budget meetings. We have a Saturday workshop where we spend almost an entire day on a Saturday, line by line, go going through the budget. So to say that we are not transparent is absolutely a mischaracterization of the situation. This year alone we have gone to several civic and community groups discussing budget issues, discussing what we hope to see in the future of Scarborough schools, and asking for input. We have been met with open arms, people asking questions, and we are happy to answer the questions. Any email we receive, any phone call, any person talking to us on the street, we are happy to answer the questions. The answers are always that we are trying to rebuild the Scarborough schools, which were 
cut drastically four years ago. We are nowhere near getting back to where we were four years ago, let alone improving. All those schools ahead of us on the list are making incremental improvements year after year, and instead we're fighting for any fraction of improvement beyond paying the bills that already exist. Um, I just really urge the council to listen to every voice. Whether someone's lived in town for 40 years or 40 days, was born in Scarborough, or has chosen to raise their kids here and just moved here because they want to live in Scarborough, every voice counts, not just the people who have been here a long time. Because if that's the case, my vote counts more because I've lived in Scarborough my whole life, except when I was in college and law school. Law school. So I absolutely urge the council to take into consideration all the work and the efforts that have been done by both boards to bring together a sensible budget, as presented last time by Mr. Chiazzo. Thank you. Thank you. Would anyone else like to speak that hasn't spoke yet? <laughs> <laughs> My name is uh, Brad Dupey and I reside at 35 Evergreens Road, <coughs> Evergreen Farms Road in Scarborough. And I have been a resident of Scarborough since 1976 or approximately 38 years and I've been pleased to live here. As I am now semi-retired semi and have been taking a greater interest in where my income is being spent, naturally the tax structure of the community becomes a large interest as it takes a sizable portion of my income, as I would assume it is true for everyone here. I just I made a table of where my taxes have gone in the last five years, and rather than go through every year, I'll just tell you that my taxes have gone up $1,251 in the last five years, which equates to a 26.1% overall, an average of 5.22% a year. Now, I don't know how that's going to be sustainable for everybody to keep going, particularly when budgets keep going higher than that. It has always been my belief that when people are willing to run for public office, the fiscal responsibility is a condition that should be foremost in their minds, regardless of position they are a candidate for. This also means they are fiscally responsible to all members of the community, not a select group or a select few of people. This brings me to the school board. There is no way I can justify saying they are being fiscally responsible in large requests for increased budgets. For the last two years, they have been asked by the town council to flat fund their budgets. Instead, they have submitted budgets far from flat. I get the feeling sometimes that this may be a contest. They submit large budgets knowing they won't get it, but the higher they go, the more they may end up with. There appears to be a feeling that they are entitled to as much as they want regardless of the other needs the town budget also has to support. This independent feeling was illustrated in the meeting prior to the vote defeating the proposed budget by the school board. The school system is receiving approximately 55 to 56 percent of the total budget and they show no regard to the needs of the rest of Scarborough. I do not believe that outsiders think of this community only as an educational center but all aspects that make it a desirable town to live in. If people can't afford the tax structure, I don't feel they will be coming to Scarborough to live. And as people in this room get older and those taxes keep coming up, and as you retire, are you going to stay in Scarborough? Are you going to be happy? Are you going to be able to afford that? In reality, the famous 80-20 rule comes into play. This is an approximation, but I don't believe that it's too far off. This means that 80% of the families are paying the vast majority of the bill for 20% of the families with children in the school system. I am quite certain a fairly large portion of residents are senior citizens that can't keep accepting large property tax increases. I, for one, am tired of being held hostage by the school board and its unreasonable budget requests. The town council has asked for flat funding and the board just does what it wants. The town council should stand up and reject their budget with the first budget submitted. The council should ask them to meet their request of flat funding, otherwise it is a mute request. If the school board feels they are fiscally responsible to the town, why would they give an increased pay to superintendent and twistle at this particular time when we have a major problem going on in terms of the budget? 
I don't believe this is the time to be doing that when the town is questioning the school budget. I guess in the end, I would just like to say that I, I realize the need for education. Fortunately, I've been educated myself, but I think that the town council and the school board need to look at what they're asking for each year. You, 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 you can't jump to the top right away. It takes time. If you want to get back there, you got to sympathize with everybody in town. It, not everyone can keep spending additional money on taxes. Just can't be done. Thank you for your time. Excuse me, sir. Everybody, you can speak again, but we have to get through people that haven't got a chance to speak. Sorry, I saw other people go through. Right. I meant, uh, did anybody? Did anybody else? Okay, that's okay. Um, anybody that is out there that hasn't spoke that like to speak, please get up to stand up here because uh, this gentleman here, as soon as he speaks, I'll be closing the public hearing. Okay. Thank you. Go ahead. All right. Thank you. My name is Will Rowan. I live at 14 Bonnie Grove Drive. <coughs> Um, I purchased my home in 2009 and I opened a business here in 2011. Um, I pay property taxes on both and uh, I don't like paying taxes, so I don't think anyone does. Um, and it's not surprising that when you have a re referendum asking if you want taxes to be higher or lower, uh, it would come back with lower taxes winning. Um, but I have to agree that we're shortchanging our children. We are one of the most affluent towns in the state, but we spend thousands of dollars less per child per year than our neighbors spend and it isn't fair to our kids. I know of three families who in the last year have chosen other towns over Scarborough with school spending being one of the reasons given. Those families went or are in the process of going to Cumberland, Gorham, and Saco. Um, I don't want to live in the town that underfunds its school over a long period of time. Schools fail, property values go down, crime goes up, and there will be no quick fix. These are short-sighted decisions that we're making, and I don't want to be Scarborough Excuse me, I don't want to have Scarborough become the town that no one wants to live in, uh, but what are we going to look like in 10 or 15 or 20 years? I don't want anyone to lose their home over property taxes, and I don't want our town employees, excuse me, I want our town employees to be well compensated and our police and fire departments to be well funded. They pay property taxes in South Portland and Cape Elizabeth and Agunquit and Yarmouth and Kennebunk and Cumberland and North Yarmouth and Gorham, and they all pay more than we do, but they also fund their schools very well and the families that are moving into this area know it. Um, so I'd like to see this council take a long view. I'd like to see us reach school spending parity not just with the state average, uh, but with the higher spending of our surrounding communities. I'd like to have us have a debate about the merits of having the best schools in the area and having Scarborough being a beautiful seaside town that everyone wants to live in. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, uh, we get it. Like I asked, everybody that would like to speak that hasn't spoke, please come up to the podium now. Please. Uh, good evening, uh, Carol Gotro, uh, 27 Jamaco Mill Road, and uh, new to Scarborough one year, uh, and didn't intend to speak tonight either. But I think there's a piece that's missing. I've been listening to everybody speak tonight, and uh, I'm all for lower taxes. Um, I was in a budget committee in a, in a town that I lived in prior to this, and we were able to keep a flat line for four years. Now, we didn't do this by saying you can't spend. I really believe we can give our children the opportunity. However, I really also believe that council, town managers, aren't challenging the department heads to reduce cost. And that's a component I haven't heard here tonight. If you all think about it, there's a lot of wasted uh, spending in any town. And I would believe that here in Scarborough, it's got to be tremendous. I believe that there are dollars that must be out there that can be redirected. So I would challenge every department head in the town to build into their job descriptions that the job department head has a responsibility of reducing cost each and every year. And I've got to believe that everybody in this town that wants reduced taxes, if they see that activity happening and understand that people are trying, then meetings will be much, much smoother. So I would propose trying to hold the budget online or halfway in between flat and where it is now and go forward and challenge and hold people accountable for spending. There are vehicles in town. There are gas spending in town. There, there are many, many places where costs can be reduced, and I would hope that going forward, 
that's the action that we could take at this town. Thank you. <clears throat> All right, seeing no one else, um, just try to, where you've already spoke before, try to keep it short, please. Yeah, I just want to address a couple things. I, I think this count, town council needs to decide, do we want to be a mediocre town that we're known for, for low taxes and that's why people are going to come here? Or do we want to be known for educational values, things that are going to attract younger families? We've got to stop making this uh, school budget the political football it's become. I, I think the last gentleman that just spoke made some very important points. There are other areas in the entire town budget that can be looked at. We don't just need to keep scalping the schools. And people are saying $45 million, break out your checkbook. I think most of the parents here at one point or another, whether they're parents now or 10 years ago, have broken out the checkbook. It's not our individual responsibility to solely fund shortcomings at the school. It's the responsibility of this community. And that's why I moved here, and that's what is so dissatisfying now, is to see people shrugging their shoulders, not coming out to vote. And you want to see a huge vote turnout? Go threaten to cut sports. You threaten to cut sports in this town, you'll see every voter come out. Why is it so important for people to keep sports going, but we don't want to fund our children's real education? Our budget is insufficient. It's too low. We've suffered cuts in faculty. We've suffered cuts in programs, and I'm tired of seeing it. We're number 10. You've heard anecdotal evidence from other people in this community that have heard and spoken to people saying they're choosing other communities over Scarborough. You want low taxes? I guess we could become Millinocket. They probably have the lowest tax rate in the state of Maine, but they have the worst schools, and nobody wants to go back when they graduate. Is that what we're going to be, Millinocket? I go up to Millinocket to fish, but you're damn well right. I wouldn't go up there to live and raise my family. There's a good reason why I moved to Scarborough. But that's the way we're going. A gentleman came up here and said, break out your checkbook. You're going to see this town go down the tubes. You're damn right you're going to see this town go down the tubes because of us not funding our children's education. Younger families are going to either refuse to move here and choose other communities or they're going to move out. It's a fact of life. We all grow old. I'm going to be old one day, too. I hope I toe the line for the younger families because I'm towing the line for my kid and other families now. When I'm 60, 70, 80 years old, I'm going to do like my in-laws do. They don't have any kids right now in the school system at 80. They don't have a stake in the game, but they come out and they vote for the schools because they're smart enough to know that their town goes down because of the schools, so is their property values. If that's all people care about, look at it from that perspective. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Dick Springer, 15 Piper Road, apartment J313. Uh, I am a very senior citizen, probably senior to almost anybody else here. I'm 84 years old, and I moved to Scarborough at age 81. Now, some people who uh, talk about the problems of senior citizens seem to may be making the argument, what did posterity ever do for me? We have a responsibility for, toward the people who come after us and, you know, I'll be gone long before most of the kids here reach adulthood, but uh, if we uh, fulfill our obligation to the children here, which uh, all of us have and should feel, uh, we have to provide them with, uh, I would say, a better education than Scarborough is providing now, and I think it's doing very well uh, with uh, the funds that it's been able to get. I think it's made a very effective use. And one other point, if people are unhappy about the way taxes have gone up, they should look to the person who was responsible. And I wonder how many of the people here voted for the person who was responsible, and that is Governor Paul LePage. No applause, please. I think everybody just came in. But. Okay, I'm closing the public hearing. So I have a motion. <coughs> second. 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 Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, discussion. Discussion? <laughs> discussion. Uh, I'm please. I'd like to make a motion. Amendment. Amendment. An amendment. Yes. But it's still a motion. <laughs> okay. Two um we as a council met in January, and we agreed that the taxes had been going up 
over 21 percent in the last four years, and we agreed that we. We agreed. Can you hear that? Yep. We agreed as a town council that the taxes were going up 21 percent, or over 21 percent, last four years, and that we wanted a flat line budget this year, no more than one and a half percent increase for CPI. And we haven't done it. We're not even close. So I'm, I want to make a motion to reduce the increase in the education budget by an additional $948,000. And that... Get quiet. This is debate. And that council, please. brings the increase in the mill rate to 1.5%. It also still allows a 4.8% increase in the education budget. So, Do we have a second? Seconded by Councilor Benedict. Discussion. Go ahead. Yeah. Councilor Holbrook. Um, although I, I absolutely can appreciate um, where you're at and, and where you're trying to go with that, um, and, and I do applaud the effort. I, I do, however, feel it's a little too much of a chunk, um, especially for, for one year. Um, you know, another million dollars, I think, would go into some pretty deep cuts. And I think that's that transition tipping point of where you're going to start looking at significant layoffs at that point. Um, especially at this point in the game, we're talking, this is fiscal year 14, September's around the corner. I can kind of envision in my head where this is going to go. I mean, this is going to be your you know, your sports teams, your, you know, that that's where it's going to land. You know, I, I appreciate what you're trying to do, and I appreciate um, the thought process behind it, which is, you know, something of, of that measure would be significant change, you know, reorganization and administration and maybe changing bus routes and those sorts of things. It, it would mean significant structural changes. Um, to delve that deep in, in one swoop. And on a personal level, I, you know, uh, on the personal, the taxes are an issue. I, I, you know, this is where it thinks to be a counselor sometimes, you know. Um, I, I get it on a personal level, but as, as an overall best interest of, of what the education is going to be, I, I can't bring myself to support that. Um, yeah, so I'll leave it at that. Councilor Caterina. Uh, yeah, with all due respect to uh, Council Blaze, and I certainly understand, you know, his thinking behind his amendment, and I appreciate him uh, bringing it forward. But I, I did a little math, which can be a scary thing for someone like me to do. But the difference between the 1.5 percent, uh, which is the effective tax rate proposed by Councilor Blaze. And the 3.25% tax rate, which would be the tax rate if we stay with what the school board recommended um, that we heard at the, at the first reading, on the average or median house uh, in Scarborough, which is a $300,000 house, which is my house, for example, that's a $78 a year difference, which is $1.49 a week. That's seventy-eight dollars, dollar forty-nine a week. I'm so, I, I, I think that uh, for me to pay an extra seventy-eight dollars, I don't like paying taxes any more than anyone else does. Believe me. Uh, but I, I just think that um, that's a good investment in the kids in our school. So I would not support uh, Councilor Blaze's uh, amendment. Okay. And Council Benedict. Well, <coughs> since the beginning, back in January, when we all agreed on flat funding, and I've stood behind that from that point on, and I believe that it's the school department's financial people that that should carry that should carry some weight 
Otherwise, like well, the gentleman spoke. Otherwise, it's what we do is mute. It makes no difference. We don't invent where the dollars come from. We spend a good amount of time calculating back, speaking to people in the town. Uh, I can I can point to right now, and if you'd like the addresses, I'll give them to you. Three different uh, people that are moving out because they can't afford the taxes, and they've been here for 40 years. I find that a little too bad, but it also has a message behind it that we've got to listen to that side of the coin also. Um, none of us here are doing this particularly from a personal point of view. We're representing what we hear. I can show you in the iPads we have about 24 emails that we just received today. And this one person had an email that was about this long. And quite honestly, I wrote back and said, gee, where were you in January? Why has nobody heard from you till six hours before the meeting that we have to come up with final numbers? This comes up every year at the same time. And it, it's it, unfortunate that we've got to be so apart on the numbers. But I think the town can only afford so much not to the point of doing disservice to the children at all. I've got three daughters that are out of high school quite a while. And I actually, when we moved here 13 years ago, my middle daughter moved right around the corner from us, from Massachusetts. And I do have my own blood in high school starting next year. Graduates tomorrow from eighth grade. And it kills me to see the dissension. If we come up with something, there's a reason for it. And as many of you said, I don't like playing a game of, okay, they came in here, we're going to come in here. Yep. Too far apart. And as far as I'm concerned, I'm going to stick to the lowest possible. And I think that what uh, Mr. Blaze brought up, just fine. Thank you. Any uh, Anyone else? Uh, Council uh, Okay. Council Blaze. Well, I, I'd just like to say that... Uh, I know that this is a, it's a, it's an additional big cut, but I think we have a responsibility that we've got to keep we we've got to get the taxes back in order. We we can't have these massive increases every year. And every every person in this in this room every family has to make decisions every year, financial decisions every year. You can't just have everything. And I think what we're trying to do here is we're just asking, and this amendment still provides two million dollar increase over the current year's budget. Just make some choices. There was a woman that stood up earlier. She said, "We have to learn to make the right choices. Let's, let's start doing it." Excuse me. Um, no public comment at this time. You, Everybody's had the chance to get up and speak. We've listened to you. It's time now for the council to talk amongst ourselves. And Council Blaze is at the point where he's trying to convince his fellow councilors to see it the way he sees it. So please respect that. Council Blaze. I have no other comments. Okay. Anyone? Councilor Donovan. <coughs> Councillor Blaze is proposing that we increase the school budget by about $2 million over last year's spending, 1.5%. And uh, I totally support the spirit of 
that uh, that amendment. Uh, I'm not going to vote for it because sitting on the finance committee uh, and studying the situation that the school presented to us, it was obvious that just to keep an even keel, just to pay the raises that are contractually obligated to uh, pay for the health care increases that are outside the control of the school uh, uh, district, uh, it was going to require uh, a budget increase of about 2.9%. And so I settled reluctantly upon uh, the judgment that uh, we do not want to do harm to the uh, school system. We want to be able to carry on the programs and the staffing at the levels that are presently uh, there. Uh, the exceptional nature has been uh, uh, repeated in many personal accounts tonight, uh, but that uh, the situation presented by the school board justified something higher than 1.5 in balancing the interests of the community. People who want us to be respectful of their budget uh, and their economic restraints and people who wish us to make sure that the schools are maintained at the exceptional level that it seems everyone agrees they are. So I won't support it, but uh, I will support uh, another motion that to be made. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Donovan. Um, now, to make the record clear, um, and you can go right back to the workshop, um, it, the video online, I said flat funding sounds good, but it's not reasonable. It can't be obtained. You have increases in um, energy. You have increases in fuels for vehicles. You have increases in contractual <laughs> obligations. You have, and part of those obligations are insurance. There's a lot that goes into it. And I heard um, that, you know, uh, and I commend the new group started, um, and I support their efforts as far as looking into budgets and, and seeing where there are savings. And maybe we'll um, be able to see <coughs> what we see as counselors and, um, and, and have a better understanding of the budget. And I'm telling you right now, this town council will be open, open and it'll be transparent for this group. They'll get their information and I, I trust the school will be the, do the um, do the same. Um, I cannot, in good faith, um, support a cut of almost a million dollars to the school, and I will not. Um, I understand where the taxpayers are coming from, but uh, there is there may be ways to have savings down the road later on um, in in the school budget. Maybe there's not, but. Uh, I'm not going to support this, and I may support something different um, tonight, uh, and I'll end with that. I'll have more to say as we go on. Anyone else? That being said, all those in favor? Two. All those opposed? Okay. Back to the main motion. <coughs> Discussion. I Councilor Kennedy. Again, um, I, I appreciate the work that the school board did. I know that the original budget that came out, I was not happy with, uh, and I'm a big supporter of schools, as, as I say over and over and over again. And regretfully, I think it set the tone for some of what's going on here tonight uh, in that uh, a lot of people haven't paid close attention to the cuts the school board has made to what they originally proposed. Uh, that being said, um, I too have gotten a lot of emails, as have we all, in the last couple of days. And I would say the emails that I've gotten are about 50-50 between support the budget, 
adult sports budget. Uh, I, again, my little math that I've done, um, on a $300,000 house in Scarborough to support the budget as it's proposed by the school board would mean $144 on a $300,000 house or $2.77 a week. I spend more than that for a cup of coffee, to be honest with you. Um, again, I'm a former educator. I believe in our future. Our future is, is our children, and we do need to make an investment in children, and I feel that spending on schools is not spending but investing. Therefore, I will be supporting a 3.25% staying with the uh, budget that the school board proposed. Thank you. One down that end. Anyone up? Okay. But I think this is all those. Uh, 3.25. Oh. All those. Yeah, let's take three. Pardon? The roll call vote for fine. Oh, roll call vote. Okay, sorry. <laughs> Uh, Tody, can you do a roll call, please? Yes. Councilor Holbrook? No. This is the final vote. Yes. Okay. Uh, Councilor Donovan? No. Councilor oh. Katarina? Yes. Councilor Benedict? Councilor Benedict? No. Councilor Blaze? No. Councilor St. Clair? No. Chairman Sullivan? No. Is there... That was well, uh, I would like to move... Just a minute. taking a short minute to confer about <laughs> procedurally how, how that works. <laughs> it's warm and 90 degrees outside. <laughs> Richard, tell Richard to call five minutes. Clear this up. Um, this was a final roll call vote. I don't think that the council understood yeah. that, that it what what the ramifications of the final vote. So I was under the impression that we were we were under the impression that we were voting on Councillor Katarina's motion. Okay. It was not. Un, I did not. I was not under the impression we were voting on the final vote. Okay. <coughs> Excuse me. So problem would be yeah. to go back on Cody. Yeah. yeah. I, I think the confusion was the suggestion from the count, Councilor Katarina was actually the main motion itself. It was not an, right. an amendment. And so I, I think there was, was it a new motion? There was some misunderstanding on the part of uh, the council what you were voting on. I might suggest that you kind of roll back to that point. <laughs> okay. Um, and, and, and essentially at this point, uh, further amendments are in order and should be offered before the main motion is voted. Right. Oh, no, that's what I was, okay, that's what I was asking. But I thought, okay, back to the main motion, are there any amendments? Councilor Donovan. <coughs> uh, I would move, uh, I would uh, uh, offer an amendment to the main motion. 
uh, to include reducing the school budget by an additional $186,000 to reach a 2.9% overall tax rate increase. <coughs> Second. Okay, discussion. Um, Councilor Donovan. Uh, as I said earlier, uh, the Finance Committee work really led me to believe that it was unavoidable that we increase the budget beyond what I think all of us had hoped we could do. Uh, the uh, school board uh, and administration does a good job of tracking what is what they call a level services budget. <clears throat> and that means everybody who's on the staff uh, is retained, all the programs that are in operation are retained, uh, uh, and the costs that have to be incurred uh, are covered. Uh, and that represented a 2.9% increase uh, in the town's tax rate. <coughs> uh, it, uh, it also co comes with uh, a huge cost increase uh, to us beyond what I would normally support, but I think the circumstances force us to accept this sort of level of increase in this year. Uh, it increases the spending by over 6%, uh, uh, and it adds $2.5 million to the spending that was incurred last year. So we're going up two and a half million dollars in the budget. And what you achieve by that is you retain all of the programs and all of the staff. Uh, uh, and quite honestly, I have been very impressed by the, the uh, uh, school department, independent of the voices that we've heard here today. They are obviously uh, uh, thoughtful, talented, skilled, uh, and we didn't get to where we are in the ratings by not having a first-rate uh, uh, school board, uh, staff, uh, senior administration. When you look at the statistics, uh, the statistics actually uh, 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 have to be viewed in the light of the size of our school. We're tenth, but yet we are the top performing school for schools of our size or larger. We're, we're number one. Uh, when you look at uh, how we compare against Falmouth or Cape Elizabeth or Yarmouth or Cumberland, uh, when you look at the per capita income of each of those communities, it is dramatically higher than our, than our per capita income. And there is a direct correlation uh, in both performance and funding of schools based on how wealthy the community is. We're doing a good job uh, in both our, the performance of our students uh, and in the funding of our schools. Uh, and it's a credit uh, to our schools. We shouldn't be fighting uh, over, over, you know, the schools are, are underperforming. They're not underperforming. This is a terrific school system. Uh, and so I was comfortable in this very difficult budget uh, atmosphere that we're in in supporting something that would continue because we are going to get better uh, in the schools because we've got people in place who will make our schools better. But we're just not in a position where we can, inf where we can fund it to add any substantial number of additional personnel or programmatic uh, scope. Uh, so that, uh, those are all uh, part of the, the, the reasoning that I arrived at in saying 2.9% is a fair balance. And this school, the town council's in an awkward position. We're being asked almost to handicap uh, what's, what's a fair balance here? Because we don't even have the final say. Uh, the town will go out on June 10th and vote and say whether or not this is approved or not. I think there's going to be an equal number, at a 2.9% increase, of people who are unhappy because this is underfunded, and uh, equal number of people who are going to say it's overfunded. But I would hope that most people would vote yes, because if you take a 
step back and say, what's a reasonable compromise here? This is it. And so that's how I arrived at, uh, at this, uh, this amendment. Okay, Councilor Katerina. I have some more Katerina math here. Um, the difference between the 2.9, which has been proposed by Councilor Donovan, and then the 3.25 is proposed by the school board, amounts to uh, 30 cents a week, $15 a year. So when you consider the leverage you can get for that minimal amount of increase to stay with the 3.25, and the amount of dollars you can leverage with that, I think it's a pretty darn good deal. So that's my negotiating okay. strategy. <laughs> yeah, um, I, I'm going to keep my con my comments confined to the the 2.9 number. I have some overall comments for later when we get back to the main motions. But um, here, I I'll support the 2.9. Um, you know, at the end of the day, you're still. $2.5 million more that you're investing into the schools this year than over what we did last year. Um, yeah, it's not the number the school would like, but um, as everything, you know, I, I think it's also an important thing to, to realize that sometimes, like it's been said before, is you can't always get absolutely everything you want. You do the best you can with, with what you have available. And I think that's the lesson that I would rather teach my own children is I make my decision based on, you know, just like I do in my home. It is not the best of something. It is not excellent. It is not A grade, but it was the best I could do for you within the means that I had. So maybe it's, like I said, not an A++ excellent, but it's still very good in these times, in these conditions. So I'll support the 2.9. Um, and again, I appreciate Jean Marie that it's fifteen dollars. But you know, hey, it's, if I don't have fifteen dollars in my hand, I still don't have fifteen dollars in my hand. So um, again, I'll be supporting the two point nine. Council Saint Clair. I'll also be supporting that. I'm not. I'm. I'm not thrilled with it. Or pleased. Um, I wish we had. I wish we had more to give. But I wish I had more to give. Um, my own kids. My own responsibilities. Um, I've always been a firm believer in. Um, what do we, what do we what do we have to have right now versus? Okay, what can we hold off a year or two? Um, so I, I've lived by that. Um, I've talked about that numerous times. Um, it, it's tough everywhere we go. It's it's tough all around. I have children that go to school. Um, I have a daughter who has a free period because she's lost um, one of her art sessions. Um, I'm not thrilled. I mean, that doesn't make me happy. I'd love to be able to give that back to her. Um, but I also have a responsibility to all of Scarborough, not just one demographic of Scarborough. Um, the, my, my other, I, I say all that, and then I find myself some, at times contradicting myself because when I talk about the police department or the fire department, they are the specialty. They that that's their specialty. So when they come forward with their budget, or they come forward with their recommendations, I look at those things and I say, they're the, they, that's their specialty. That's what they do. So I'm, I put faith in that they're telling me that this is what's the best thing for them. Um, it's hard, so I, I internally, it's an internal conflict with myself when it comes to the school budget because you, that is your profession. That is what you are a specialty. I am not in education. Um, but I have a responsibility to all of Scarborough. And so with that being said, I, 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 I will at this point support your motion. Anyone else? All right, well, I guess with this, um, the 2.9, I'm sure that um, school supporters are unhappy and people who said the taxes are too high will be unhappy. <laughs> but um, 
obviously we have to come to a conclusion tonight to send it out to the voters. Um, so um, sounds like there's support for it. So uh, I'll support the 2.9. It's uh, not as drastic as the earlier um, one and a half percent, which is I definitely can't see happening. So. I will support that, and if there's no other, um, I'll uh, go for the vote. Um, all those in favor? Opposed? Okay. It's close. Now, we go back to a roll call. Okay, correct. Is there any further amendments? Any others? No, okay, seeing none, there'll be a roll call vote this time. Do you have any more <coughs> Pardon me? Any more comments? Comments. Oh, okay. Comment, yes. Because <laughs> I'm just beating down the door to have that. Okay, um, I apologize. <laughs> yep. um, I say some of my comment, if I will. Um, I, I want to go back to this as a whole package here. Um, there's been a lot of discussion about, you know, take some from the municipality, give it to the school, and what's the school, you know, what's the municipality doing to help, um, you know, we keep losing all our funding, what's going on, you know, all these other things. Um, so I, I just wanted to take a few minutes to answer some of that, um, as well as I want to, to make thoroughly sure, I agree that I, everybody that emailed, um, I greatly and thoroughly appreciate the time, I, although I, I wound up having to unfortunately write a standard reply response um, I do actually read every single one of those emails. Granted, it might be at midnight, but um, that, that's helpful. Um, again, I, I don't think I really gained a sense either way. It was very split. Um, it really was, you know, please don't raise my taxes. I can't afford it to save our schools. And it really was an even split. Um, I, I will say this, and I want just for the folks at home, I appreciate again that you come down and you speak, but it is infinitely harder for somebody to come down here and stand at this podium and say, I don't have it. Mm -hmm. So for those of you that did, again, I appreciate that. I appreciate that you took the time. And again, I can understand how absolutely hard that is to, to face your peers in your community and say, I can't do it. Um, the other thing I would like to go back to is, um, you know, we have a continuing problem, which is our state funding, which is that we don't get a whole lot of it, and the municipality is no different. Um, so when you're asking us, what are we doing to help our schools, my answer to you is, in the course of the last five years, the municipal side of this budget has actually reduced spending by 2.9% in a five-year period. Every single penny of your tax increase over the last five years has gone to education or our Cumberland County tax bill. Not one single penny is being sunk into the municipality. If you defy anybody to please give us that idea. I chaired finance committee. If you have a concept or you have a cost savings idea, please do tell us. We have suggestion boxes. If you can't do that, email me. If you can't do that, email Tody. I will gladly take any suggestion you have and bring it back to the Finance Committee and work through it some more. Um, again, we face the same challenges that the school does. We lose revenue from the state every year. Every year, more houses are built. That's more roads to plow. Mm -hmm. I have firefighters that we are missing half of our volunteer force and our call volumes are up twofold. And I still need to send somebody to respond to your calls. We are not facing any challenges that are any different than the school departments. It's just that we have managed to do it. So my answer to that is we've held the line. We've done everything humanly possible to hold the line. Um, could we probably do a little more? Absolutely. Um, yes, I know it's easy to point at something like the beach house. I promise you that a tax-paying dime was spent on that. That was solely <laughs> paid for out of beach revenues. Those were monies that community services collected. Yes, we pay a little bit more for certain things, but again, you know, we face the same challenges as, as everybody else. We have higher energy costs. 
We're investing in that energy. We're doing the best we can with it. We've initiated a tri-gen model that will produce energy and heating. We've taken on a solar project. So yes, there's an upfront cost, and maybe you saw a little bit of an upfront cost, but we will get it tenfold back in the long run over a 30-year period. So again, it's a modest increase on the municipal side, but even still, it's still overall 2.9 less. So um, that was my two cents for that. Um, and I'll stop my ramblings now. <laughs> I, well, <laughs> Councilor Katarina. Um, I just want to make something clear also. Uh, I ain't, as you know, I'm going to be supporting the 3.25%. I'm Hopefully I made that abundantly clear. But what I also want to make abundantly clear is that my, my plan is, is to work with the superintendent and the school board to delve into the budget. I, just, I was elected November 20th. Um, I haven't had a whole lot of time. I'm just absorbing everything, everything, everything all at once. But I do want to look and make sure that we have all the efficiencies we can have in the school budget because I think there are some other places that some savings could be made and I look forward to having some discussions on that. But I just wanted to put that forward too. Thank you. I lied, I know, and I right. wiggled my little finger at you. Um, the other thing I, I guess I want to say is this year that was a little different than previous years. Um, certainly, Jean Marie has taken quite a lead in helping us communicate better to our state legislatures as well as Richard. Um, we hosted a workshop at the big onset of our budget season to try to advocate that, you know, point blank, we're mad. We want our money. Stop cutting us. And... You know, when, when you ask what can you do to help and what can you do to help the situation, advocate, absolutely advocate. We can sit in a room around a table until the cows come home and tell our state rep stop cutting our funding and stop, you know, making us take care of your roads and all the other things that you let roll downhill for us to deal with because you're not up there. But advocate, 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 advocate. If we're hosting a meeting or, you know, come, tell them. Tell them how disgruntled you are because it, that's what it will take to help. Um, you're not going to get millions and millions of dollars in a single budget in one year mm -hmm. to, to fix all these gaps. That, that, that's what it boils down to. It, it can't happen in a single year. So the best thing is just advocate. Right. And I just wanted to um, piggyback off of what you said earlier about um, different items that have been brought up that the municipality did um, that didn't cost the taxpayer thing. We go through the same thing the school does. People say things that aren't true. Um, we see, read them all the time in our emails. And so we do go through the same thing as the school board does with uh, misperceptions and um, misquotes and, you know, to that latitude. But the main thing is, is we, every year we, uh, we listen um, to the people. Um, this year, uh, I've never seen such a larger outcry of um, people that are upset with their taxes, and it's, gonna, it's not going away. So um, that's pretty obvious. So we do need to look into how we do things and how we can do them better um, with cost savings um, that isn't going to cripple our schools or uh, cripple um, the municipality. So as we look forward, going forward, um, you know, that's, you know that it's a good thing that you know we're uh, we're going to have a group that's going to advocate uh, for the taxpayers, and we have the group that advocates for the school, and hopefully we can come to a happy medium. Uh, the biggest thing that I hear every year my, about their home prices. Well, you know what? I don't care about mine because I want to die in my house. I want to stay here the rest of my life. The only reason why I'm going to sell my house is because I can't afford the taxes. So that's what I'm looking at. Um, so it is it is a problem, and it's it's a problem for all of us as a community. And how we deal with that is is the question. 
so um, moving forward, um, I, I hope we can uh, work on this along with the school uh, next year. I, I've been last two years now um, advocating for things in Augusta and um, Jean Marie's joined and uh, sometimes and she was a great help because uh, when I get caught up with uh, my work and uh, wasn't able to go because of mandatory training um, Jean Marie was there to help out so it's a good thing and we got to just keep on them um, to stop set Biggest thing is unfunded mandates, right? We got to work on that. So um, that being said, um, is there any anyone from this side that's got any comments? No. Any more, <laughs> Jessica? No, I'm not. Okay. On this one. All right. Roll call. Roll call vote. Councilor Holbrook. Yes. Councilor Donovan. Yes. Councilor Katarina. Am I in the roll if I'm three point two five? I'm sorry. I'm yes. No. Councilor Benedict? No. <coughs> Councilor Blaze? No. Councilor St. Clair? Yes. Council Chairman Sullivan? Yes. I get a little confused. Yeah. So, you want to take a five minute break? Oh, yeah. We'll take a five minute break. Let the, let the line clear. Okay, because we got to discuss this.
market in Delhi. Boot handles license. Anyone here? Seeing none, I'll close the public hearing. So I have a motion. Move approval. Second. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? Opposed? No. There's no old business. I'll move on to new business. Order number 1453 is the first reading, and this needs to be referred to the planning board. It's uh, the zoning ordinance. I apologize for uh, refer to the planning board. The proposed changes to Chapter 405, the Town of Scarborough Zoning Ordinance, to create a transmission tower overlay district and to update the performance standards there too. All right. Do at this point do we have any public comment on um, the uh, transmission towers? Mr. Chair, may, may it be helpful for Dan Bacon just to provide oh, an introduction? Okay. There may yes. be a comment it's that comes from correct. that. Yes, I'm sorry. Yep. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just I've, have a map up on the screen. Um, this is a, an initiative that's been worked on uh, for a good number of months in the Ordinance Committee. And uh, staff's been working with the committee and some industry representatives really on steps to improve um, cell service and wireless service within the town. Um, so as part of this effort, uh, the Ordinance Committee actually commissioned uh, a consultant to provide a coverage analysis of where service is good and where it's poor within the community. Also, Ordinance Committee members shared their personal um, knowledge of, <laughs> of coverage in the community. Um, and this is a map that shows the results of the coverage analysis and to, um, to narrate it for you a little bit, uh, the green is where there's <coughs> good, generally good in-building coverage, wireless coverage within Scarborough. The brownish orange color is um, decent coverage within vehicles, um, but not necessarily in buildings. And the white is unreliable coverage within Scarborough. And um, so as a result of this study and a lot of Ordinance Committee discussion, um, staff and the Ordinance Committee have come up with the amendments that are before you under this, um, this action item. And uh, there are changes to our zoning ordinance, particularly the performance standards, um, and also the zoning districts in which uh, wireless facilities or transmission towers, as they're referred to, and telecommunication facilities are allowed. Um, so really the key five areas that the ordinance is changing um, are as follows. One is where transmission towers are allowed and allowing them in the rural zones in town, the RF and the RFM. And the reason for that is because of where coverage is poor. The, the whiter areas are generally the rural zones in town. The next map. Here, and it, I realize it's small from your seats, but you have it in your packages as well. Um, the red cross hatched areas are where um, it's proposed to allow for transmission towers where they're not currently allowed. Currently, they're only allowed in our industrial zones. And the proposal is to allow them subject to planning board review in the rural and farm districts, the rural and farm manufactured housing districts, um, and two zones more central to the community that have poor coverage, uh, the Crossroads District where it's Scarborough Downs and the Village Residential 4, um, which is <coughs> between here and uh, Payne Road. Another proposed change is the height of towers. Currently the limit right now is 100 feet and the proposal as um, recommended to you by the Ordinance Committee is to go to 150 feet, and that's for um, primarily to enable co-location onto the towers. Um, and that's another requirement in the proposal is to prevent redundancy in terms of towers, uh, preventing a, a wide range of towers just to serve or provide service for one cell provider is to actually uh, enable and require multiple carriers to locate on the same tower, thereby re reducing the overall number of towers. Um, so the recommendation from our consultant is 
to go to 130 to 135 feet to enable three to five different carriers on the same tower, when a lower height of 100 feet would not necessarily enable that. Um, another key change is the requirement for co-location, as I just mentioned, um, and there's performance standards about uh, enabling space on a tower if a provider is going to come in and put in a tower to enable it at least three providers to be on that same tower. The two other key changes are establishing removal requirements um, for abandoned towers or towers that are no longer used at the end of their life or when technology changes so that we don't have um, large structures in the community that aren't being used any longer. So there's performance standards about expectations for removal and restoring the site. Um, and the other key change is um, a change to our standards for, we'll call them stealth or building mounted antennas um, to uh, make it easier for wireless providers to locate, say, in a church steeple or on top of a taller building um, to uh, avoid the need for building a tower. Right now, only municipal buildings and churches are allowed to have um, towers on top of structures, so if in this proposal broadens that allowance for commercial buildings or other taller structures to, to go to the planning board or zoning board to locate um, wireless antennas on them, and the boards have uh, review criteria to ensure that they fit into the architecture of the building and uh, in some cases hopefully enclosed within the building or in a, a steeple so that they're not visible from the exterior. Um, so that's, those are the, uh, the larger key items with the proposed changes. I'm happy to answer questions if the council has any. Um, could I say something also? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I also just want to say that this is obviously the first reading. Um, I know that um, sometimes when it's, um, so as I'm chair of the ordinance committee, um, sometimes when it's in the ordinance committee, it doesn't get as much publicity. It's not talked about as much. When it hits our full table, it usually sometimes gets a little bit more publicity and we get more phone calls about it. I'm very happy to, um, and I know Dan also is and anyone else, um, I'm more than happy to meet with anyone that has questions or concerns about um, you know, the information that's being displayed. Um, personally, I have major issues with the cell phone coverage in Scarborough. Um, I think we need to catch up a little bit. Um, I will say that we had a meeting the other day and I was extremely impressed with all the carriers that came. Obviously, they have a vested interest in it, so they're, they're going to want to help us. Um, but I was impressed with their professionalism. Um, they're willing to work with us. They were impressed with us that we're kind of trying to move forward a little bit with this. So um, all in all, I think we have good relationships with the with the carriers, and I think it's going to, um, I think it should actually be um, a good help. So I encourage you, if you have questions, con concerns, comments, um, please email me. Um, we'll set up a time to meet and talk, and we'll go through some of this stuff um, and hopefully be able to come to a good conclusion. Council Holbrook? I just had a question about, um, how far projecting, I, I know it's kind of probably an educated guess, but how far out before, you know, as long as this passes at the council level, before, you know, maybe some towers could come up that people would receive better coverage and perception and um, talking like a five year out or one year out? I think that um, cell providers have been waiting and encouraging us to look at our ordinances. So, and they've been very active in the ordinance committee discussions um, and have been helpful in providing their coverage maps, their specific, um, their specific service and, and where there's holes. So I anticipate there'll be applications to the requisite boards fairly quickly. Um, you know, in certain areas, I can't say it'll um, be you know, quickly applied for in all the areas to fix all our coverage issues, but I think um, there are certainly um, companies waiting for changes and will be coming to, to come through review. They were very prepared for our questions, let's put it that I mean, I, that was my interpretation. I mean, I think 
if they just I think if we gave him the go, they'd be out back building a tower. So that was at least my impression of of them. We've also been in discussions with both Tom and I about you know potential town properties. That was also talked about at the ordinance committee level at quite at length in terms of town properties that may be appropriate for these that would give the town some lease revenue. So they've been uh, in the study that was done by our consultant actually identified uh, half a dozen to a dozen properties that may make sense um, from a cell coverage standpoint. It, of course, needs to make sense from a town council, town land usage standpoint as well. So um, that's also a possibility. Council Holbrook still. I guess I'd add a comment. Well, hey, win-win. We get a little money and Maybe I can stand in more than one spot in my house and use my cell phone. So, yeah. um, <laughs> so looking forward to seeing it back around the second reading. Councilor Donovan. Uh, uh, Councilor Hoberg was really asking the question that I had, but I, I uh, Higgins Beach has very spotty mm. coverage. I guess you go up Vesper Street and click off, you go, you're gone. So anybody who lives up that street, I just can't imagine that they. They uh, accept that as a, a condition when cell phones are so prevalent in our society today. So I think that I think that, I think that the, the issues that you'll see that that are going to arise for us um, as the council questions that we may get are going to be um, there's still some health concerns out there. People still have concerns about their health when it comes to things like that. Anything that has to do with cell anything. Um, and also, um, what it's going to look like. I mean, questions like that, I think, are a lot of the questions that we're going to start getting. Okay, and w would the, the standards that the boards apply really respond to that, that, those issues, Dan, in terms of impact on uh, neighboring properties? There are standards, uh, uh, there are buffering standards um, within the ordinance today, and those were actually looked at again by the ordinance committee for immediate abutters. Um, and there are proximity standards. There's a, the tower lot size needs to be 100% of its height um, for shadowing, things of that, concerns like that. Um, there's also a requirement or a prohibition really on towers being located in the shoreland zone, so in the resource protection zone or right up close to the to the marsh um, within the shoreland zoning setback, which is usually 250 feet from the edge of a resource. Um, so there are, there's also the planning board has the ability to ask for perspectives of what the tower looks like from surrounding um, properties. Um, and the surrounding landscape. Um, so there are some, certainly some provisions in there. Um, if there are additional concerns, we can look at that further, you know, on, on other measures, but that's what's in the ordinance and as drafted. The, um, we're just, right now, um, no comments from the council, but you can ask Dan questions, because then we have to get uh, public comment first. And have, have you investigated the standards uh, as against other towns to see whether we are are going beyond where other towns are uh, because impact is always an issue. Right. Uh, so that's why I asked that. We did look at a lot of other main community standards and that's actually where we got some of the ideas for the changes in, in what you have before you, particularly the co-location requirement. That's not something we have now. Um, and that's more of a contemporary standard to reduce the overall number of towers by requiring multiple providers in the same tower. Um, so we, we did use that as a resource, um, and we seem similar to a lot of our neighbors. Cape Elizabeth, we use their, um, a lot of their same standards and have a lot of the same standards in place today. Um, Thank you. All right. We'll come back to questions and comments. I want to hear, you know, maybe some questions from the um, from the audience and uh, we, we'll ask them. So with that being said, uh, I'm opening this up to public comment. So if anybody here would like to speak <coughs> to cell phone towers, um, please step forward the mic. Three minutes, name and address. 
Susan Wilder from Tide Mill Lane, 3 Tide Mill Lane. And I, as much as I don't like to see uh, all the lights from the towers surrounding the marsh and throughout the, um, throughout the town, I do support this and I urge you to make, to vote in favor of this because we, people are using cell phones more and more. They do not have landlines. It's a matter of safety for older people. At the Agency on Aging, we provide cell phones to people to keep them with them on an emergency basis. A lot of telehealth is now out there as a possibility, keeping people connected. Our social workers go to people's homes, and if they don't have access to the Internet, easy access to the Internet, a lot of the work they do there can't be conveyed back to the main office securely. So in spite of uh, the impact on, on what I see at night, I do support this and urge you to do so. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? I'm Susan August, 280 Black Point Road. Procedural questions? Yes. At the end of this meeting, it goes to the planning board? Yes. Okay. And I'm just going to, uh, as a resident, but it will come up at the planning board as well, um, what kind of research is being done about the present state of the health? We know it's going to be an issue. So I'm hoping that there will be some references to recent um, research and materials that address that issue. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Would anyone else like to speak? That being said, I don't see anyone, so I'll put calls to public hearing. I'll answer um, one of the questions uh, that um, there's uh, no lights on the towers unless required by the FAA administration. Okay, with that being said, I need a motion. So moved. Second. Okay, now, discuss <laughs> council discussion. I guess I'll open it um, with just saying that um, this, this started um, back when I was chair of the finance committee, which was nine, nine months ago. So uh, in every, every meeting, I've uh, mentioned the progress um, on the ordinance committee, uh, and it's been cell phone towers. Uh, and we have had some uh, folks come to the meetings and comment, and I've had uh, feedback on emails and out in public that it's about time that we address this issue. Uh, and we were, during the fi uh, ordinance committee, we were very um, specific as to we want these towers uh, put in areas that they already are on uh, located on town property. And when it uh, is located on um, private property, that they had been, that they were uh, concealed. And one of the, um, one of the interested parties in putting a tower up mentioned where they were wanted to locate one, and it's very uh, desolate. It's on a 15-acre parcel. So, uh, you know, uh, in where it's located, it, it will be very hard to be seen. Um, it's not in an in a area neighborhood. Um, so, in this, uh, I think I counted four, four sites that are exactly like that. So we're taking that all into consideration, uh, site of the towers, what they look like, uh, and co, um, how do you say it, Ian, co? They call it co-locating. Co-locating. Um, so then we want towers all over the place. We're minimizing the absolute minimal amount that we need to try to get the job done because I mean a lot of the public keeps saying to me they they pay for 4G they pay for 3G they're not getting it at their homes and a lot of people want to do away with their landlines and are unable to because of their bad cell phone coverage and I can relate to them because I went through the same thing when I built my house uh, seven years ago uh, and I had to change carriers, and that's too bad. But 
during these um, ordinance committee meetings, we had um, cell phone towel people didn't get what, all, all what they wanted. <laughs> they were, you know, I yeah. bet they were a little boisterous about it, but um, we'll try to work with them the best we can, but they're not going to get what they, uh, not all of them are probably going to get what they want. And the other thing is that the public needs to know is we hired a private consultant to uh, look at um, exactly what we, uh, I just discussed, um, the, all the different areas. And he gave us an overlay, and um, that's the overlay that we uh, broke out to all the cell phone carriers. Um, and that's the plan we're going with. Um, and like I said, uh, the next reading, um, we'll see what the public actually thinks of it. I think uh, a lot of minds have changed on this issue, seeing that cell phones have become a uh, big part of everybody's life. So it's definitely changed from 10 years ago where that w towers weren't going to be accepted. I think uh, I hear from a lot of people that it's acceptable now. <laughs> so uh, with that, I'm sorry I took up so much time, but um, I'll start down here to start. Oh, um, I, I just want to say that um, the analyst that we hired was independent, private. Um, the kind of the neat thing about him, just a side note, was he used to be a counselor down in Massachusetts. So he kind of understood, uh, you know, our procedures and how we needed to handle things, um, which I think is always a bonus. Um, as <coughs> again, I feel like I, I feel like I'm always doing this to you, Dan. But I always commend. I always want to make sure I'm commending you on this stuff because, you know, you really took what. Um, and I just had a mind cramp. I apologize on his name. Ivan. Ivan. Um, you were able to take what he brought back to us um, and really work with that. And then also the cell to the cell providers worked with that. And at our last meeting, gave a lot of input to where they thought maybe you know that wasn't such a great place, or maybe this was a great place, and why it was. And, I, I felt like that was really beneficial for us to be able to hear that and get that input, and that was really generated because of what Dan had pulled together. So, mm -hmm. um, I really had, I honestly had no idea um, what they could put them inside of, and that they could also be, um, they could also generate money for the town, which were two really, which were two wins for me. Um, and I said enough. Council of Blaze, is this going to the planning board next? Yes. Yes. Okay. Now, is is the results? Is the planning board going to hear of this prior to the June 18th meeting? No, they're going to hear it on the June. The next planning board meeting is June 23rd. So. Um, the council could have a public hearing on June 18th, but can't act on second reading until July, your July meeting. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Just being exactly. a function of the calendar, the council, yeah. uh, your own rules required to go to the planning board, and that you can't take final action until you receive their review and, and, and comment. Right. Should, should we be waiting on the public hearing until we get results back from the planning board? Yeah, well, the July, he just said we won't be able to act on it until so the July meeting. Yeah, but we're not going to find out how the planning board feels about it. Yes. No, that's not. Right. Until the July meeting when you wouldn't make a decision until after the planning board public hearing. That's not the point. So we're going into August. No, if, if you wish for the council public hearing to be combined uh, with your second reading, we certainly could do that, and it would occur in July after the public, the planning board's provided input. I mean, I don't know why we would have a public hearing prior to getting input from the planning board. Right. That doesn't make any sense to me whatsoever. I think we should be delaying the public hearing until after we get input from the planning board. That's my feeling. Fine. I agree with you. Fine. So, so we'll come back to you at, at your July meeting with the planning board recommendation. He said. Whatever no, it's, that's up to the council. Oh, I was just no, suggesting. Dan's <laughs> <what he is. laughs> like, I'm out, I'm out. <laughs> that's right. So a function of the calendar, you will not see it again until your July meeting. 
first July meeting? Because I think the planning board is going to be one meeting. There's only one in July. We only had one meeting in July. The planning board. Oh. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, I, I, I agree with do you, you. Do you guys have to see it again? No. Ordinance? No, we're done with it. Okay. So it's just the planning board? Correct. And the planning board doesn't meet again until... They had a meeting Monday, so they right, meet so three they weeks. Meet in another three, three weeks. weeks. June 23rd. <clears throat> so, right. in my opinion, we should be scheduling the public hearing for the first... Right. Here's the order. Move approval of the first reading and refer the planning board the proposed changes to Chapter 405, the Town of Scarborough Zoning Ordinance, to create a transmission tower overlay district and to update the performance standards thereto and schedule a public hearing following the filing of the planning board's recommendations. Wonderful. That's so the planning board will meet and 23rd. on the 23rd of this month and they'll give us their recommendations <coughs> so we'll be prepared to have a public hearing and have in front of us the uh, Recommendations of the planning board for the July meeting. Perfect. I think, right. I think That's the way it should be. Did I explain that good? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. We're having trouble with procedure tonight. All right. Sorry. Back down, to down here. Jim, you had the only input I have is following in counselor at the other table. I'll just be glad to be able to talk on my cell phone in my house <laughs> <laughs> in my driveway. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, Council Adult, Council Katarina. No, I've got nothing to add. Any final comments from Council Holbrook? Okay. Um, that being said, um, all those in favor? Opposed? None. Order number 1454 is the first reading to schedule a public hearing on the proposed changes to Chapter 601, the Town of Scarborough Traffic Ordinance. I could introduce this if you'd like. Uh, this yeah. matter has been with the Ordinance Committee for a better part of a year for a number of uh, reasons. Uh, what's before you this evening um, represents the recommendations from the police department and essentially they're looking to update and modernize the traffic ordinance particularly as it relates uh, to matters that are already covered by state law. So what's provided in your packet is a red line version of all the um, particular changes and there's also an attachment that provides the relevant state statute and state laws that, uh, that govern and there really does not need to be a duplication in that regard. Uh, the one issue that the Ordinance Committee dealt with and chose not to move forward at this time uh, regarded some parking at the lower end of Pine Point Road. So that's an issue that uh, will be revisited by the committee at, uh, at a future meeting. And really, I think on behalf of the committee, I think the rationale in not, uh, bringing it, not providing a recommendation is that uh, there wasn't clear consensus, one, and two, given the meeting schedule, you're not likely to have completed it by the time the summer season will be completed already. So uh, you can expect that recommendation would be forthcoming probably over the summer months. Okay. Right. Um, um, public hearing. Is anyone here would like to speak on the... Um, Changes to Chapter 601 uh, Traffic Ordinance. Sorry. Anyone? Seeing none, I'll close the public hearing and I'd like a motion, please. So moved. Second. Uh, discussion. Um, these changes were changes that I'll just speak because mm -hmm. of the ordinance here, the ordinance. These changes were, a lot of these changes were just a lot of cleanup, um, things that need, probably should have been done a while ago. Um, the PD did an, a great job of really writing it out for us. So I didn't, I didn't think any of us had any questions or concerns um, with what was brought forth. I thought um, it was all pretty cut and dry, um, and I saw no issues. Okay, um, as far as, that's exactly right, and the chief said that um, 
they're just um, basically housekeeping um, yeah. housekeeping um, items that uh, that bring us up to in line with the state. So, and just to further on the uh, parking issue that on the Pine Point Road, it's still being looked at. We had we ran into um, some uh, impacts that are gonna uh, would occur if we shut down uh, total parking on the Pine Point Road altogether. Um, so we have to look into that and uh, yeah. look at the impacts that it ca would cause. Uh, but for the time being, what we've decided to do is shut down parking from the hydrant around the corner uh, to Conroy's. Um, that's that's already should be um, no parking, so that will occur. And then the chief said there was an area up by Depot Street that would be um, signed no parking. But until we get everything. Um, Ironed out. Yeah. Um, this, that's the way it's going to have to be for this this summer, and we will definitely, uh, ongoing on the ordinance committee, be addressing uh, those issues. Yes, and I so. think I believe Conroy wasn't um, marked right. the way that it should have been. Not not the way that it should have been, right. but that there could have been better signage. Um, yeah, and I believe all, wrong, all of that signage has been installed since the committee met. So, oh, good. perfect. So it is striping too, I believe. Good. No, we have to wait on that. We we're going to be we're going to work on this on the ordinance committee to, with the uh, impacts that it caused, and we're looking at um, the road design and and what it what it will, is capable of doing safely with yeah. safety in mind. Yeah, and I'm hoping to uh, get some, we, we did get some um, input from the people from the Clam Bank um, also, so that was yep. good. And I'm, I'm also thinking of talking to some some other um, businesses down there to try to um, kind of work through some of these issues because I think the Clam Bank takes the brunt of um, a lot of beach goals. Beach goers and, and also some other businesses right, in right. the area that right. maybe shouldn't be doing what they're doing. So um, there's lots of stuff to look at down there, and we're going to do that now, now that our schedule's opened up a little bit. Okay. Any other comments? Seeing none, all those in favor? Opposed? Okay. Order number 14-55 is the first reading and schedule a second reading to approve the expenditure in an amount not to exceed $2 million from the Land Acquisition Reserve Fund for the purpose of purchasing the so-called Benjamin Farm located more specifically identified by the Scarborough Tax Assessor's Map, Map 95, Lots 5A, 6, and 10, as recommended by the Parks and Conservation Land Board, and authorize the town manager to execute any and all documents as are necessary to protect the town's interest. So this evening we do have representatives from the Land Trust here this evening and also a representative from the Parks and Conservation Land Board, whom is the, uh, the committee appointed by council and tasked with the primary responsibility of reviewing applications and requests uh, for conservation. And they're here to provide, one, an overview of the project and two, um, an overview of the recommendation from your, your committee. And I'll pass down the list. This is a copy of the presentation that you'll be receiving tonight. I think this is for you. Oh, yeah, you do. <coughs> Sorry. Just open the power. Since we're just sitting here, how beautiful it is. Mm, it's gorgeous. It's just, I mean, I, I just. So that we live in the town. It's such a beautiful town. Do you want to switch? Sorry. Apologies for the technical difficulties. Would it be helpful to uh, lower this, not for the council, for the benefit of the public? Um, 
Okay. Everyone see it okay? So what did you do? Okay. Yeah. We'll leave it. What do you have connected? We're just having a hard time getting rid of the OSX from Jeremy's computer. It's not showing up on the there, but it's showing up on the oh. screen. We're not really sure why. So we're just going to switch to my computer. Oh, which one? This is what he put in? That's what the guy put in? I guess. Oh, this is what he put in. This one there. Well, why do you want to pull this out? Can I just oh, oh, you have disconnect? Yeah, 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 yeah. Jeremy, you could start. Yep. Uh, the council does have Sorry, a copy of your presentation, and perhaps we can catch up. Well, uh, apologies for the uh, technical problems. This you, was working perfectly uh, a couple hours ago. but Jeremy, you do need to speak in the mic, right. so perhaps you can stand in front of the podium and, and move it over. Yep. Very good. Thank you. Uh, thank you, and sorry for the technical problems. Uh, I'm Jeremy Winterstein. I'm a um, director of the Scarborough Land Trust, and we're thrilled to be here today. Uh, I'm going to be talking a little bit about Benjamin Farm, the property, and um, the agreement that we've been, been able to put in place with the Benjamin family who is selling the property. And I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, why we think it's an important property, and then Sue Foley Ferguson. Uh, from the Parks and Conservation Land Bond Board is going to talk about the evaluation process and their recommendation to the Council. Just briefly, um, the, land trust, the Scarborough Land Trust was founded in 1977. We've protected with help from up many others, including the town, about 1,200 acres in town. And that's a variety of properties. And we partnered with the town and the land bond on a number of incredibly beautiful properties in different parts of town. Uh, Benjamin Farm is, has been our number one priority for over 15 years, and we've been working with Mr. Benjamin and then his five kids after that for going on over 15 years, and so we're absolutely thrilled that we, have, we finally have this opportunity of having a purchase and sale agreement and, um, and have been working on it uh, really hard over the last uh, six, seven months or so. In terms of what we think about the property, it's the property. Um, it's the property we always get asked about all over town, at a friend's house, um, at a gas station, at the hardware store, in the parking lot, wherever we go, farmer's market, it's the property. Everybody says, you, you know that farm on Pleasant Hill Road, what about that farm? And so we're just really excited that we're finally here in front of you um, and that there's a land bond in place. In terms of the property itself, just some of the highlights. <coughs> um, it's one of the largest properties in a densely populated part of town. I think uh, hopefully everybody knows where it is, but it's on Pleasant Hill Road, right by Cothard Farm, um, pretty close to Spurwink, Spurwink Road. But it's in a very densely populated part of town. It abuts Rachel Carson National Wildlife Refuge and the town's Willie Recreation Area. It's the headwaters. It's a headwaters property of the Spurwink River, and this property is part of a big block of undeveloped and open space, undeveloped land and open space that goes essentially from the Spurwink River to the Libby River and to the Scarborough Marsh. It's got great, oh, okay, yeah. So uh, there it is in front of you. Um, and you can see um, that how many houses there are nearby and how many people would stand to benefit um, in a really easy way from seeing this property protected and having it made open for public access. <clears throat> from an economic standpoint, uh, we've been thinking about some of the properties that we've been able to protect lately um, in, an in more of an economic light. Uh, one of the properties we've, we've conserved is Broad Turn Farm on the other side of town, and we did an economic analysis recently, and we found out that uh, about 5,000 people derive some economic utility from that property. Uh, that's different than this property in that Broad Turn Farm is a very active working farm, but um, when you look at the economic activity that property has generated, we hope that other properties can, can do, um, can show economic activity as well. Um, 
think along that same line, when you have real estate um, next to conserved property, those real estate prices tend to um, stay healthy or even increase in value. In the last issue of The Current or The Leader, I think there was an article about Pleasant Hill Road and the work that's going to be done on it over the next couple of months. And I think it's a $1.2 million road project that's going on. And they talked about the number of cars that travel on Pleasant Hill Road on an, on an, on an everyday basis. Protecting a property like Benjamin Farm and having that be conserved will have a direct impact on having less wear and tear on a very um, trafficked road. Another aspect um, of the property that we think is great is uh, that a property like this is cited in the comprehensive plan as being important to conserve rural character of Scarborough. And <clears throat> one more slide. Thanks. Um, the other part of the property is uh, it's really this project, we've come to really think of this as a Scarborough heritage project. A lot of places in town, as, as towns grow, um, a lot of their uh, open spaces go and a lot of their buildings get torn down. Um, the buildings at Benjamin Farm are unfortunately, unfortunately we think they're beyond repair, but the whole property is a Scarborough Heritage property. There have been, this property has been farmed for over 150 years and there have been three families who have farmed this property over the course of time and we've been in touch with two of them uh, in addition to the Benjamins and we've been able to really assemble a neat historical look at this property and we'd hope to continue that as well. In terms of just the, some project specifics, we signed a purchase and sale agreement with the Benjamin family at the end of 2013 and we have about a year to close on it. <clears throat> The purchase price, project costs, and stewardship needs are two and a half million dollars, and we've pursued a lot of options um, in trying to come together with a good strategy for this project, for this property, um, and we've been working really hard on it. Uh, one of the options that Sue is going to talk about a little later uh, involves a New England cottontail component. Um, we spent money on it, we've probably spent three or four months on it, and we came to the conclusion that the New England cottontail aspect of this project is not viable. Um, we feel that it would give up too much control, and we think this should be a Scarborough, a Scarborough project and a, and a, a Scarborough control project. Um, but that we felt that we needed to communicate that with you and also get your feedback on it. Um, that aspect of the project um, was about $925,000. So it's a really significant decision, and we felt that um, that was the best way for us to structure it. And Sue's going to go into it in a little more detail, but we just feel that this really is such an important property of Scarborough that we feel that it should be supported by land bond and private fundraising. And lastly, in terms of the, how, we, how we hope to get to the $2.5 million, we're hoping to get there through a combination of land bond funding and private fundraising. And so that would be two, we've made a request of the land bond for $2 million, and we're in the midst of a private fundraising campaign for 500000 One of the questions we get asked about a lot on Benjamin Farm is, what are you going to do with the property, or what are your plans, or what are your goals for the property? Our first goal is to, is to successfully acquire the property, and after that, one of the things we're absolutely sure of is public access and trails. Um, there are a lot of people who live in the area, a lot of people drive by the property, and a lot of people would love to go on that property. And when you're inside, when you're in the property, especially in the interior, it's absolutely beautiful. And you've got Rachel Carson land behind it, and you've got the spur rink behind that, and it's just a really beautiful property. So we'd like to do public access and trails. Another thing, theme that's been coming about that we'd like to act on is agriculture. The property has had a really interesting agricultural history, and whether it's animals, crops, or community garden, we like to be able to pursue one or some of those options, if possible. Um, habitat protection, Spurwink River protection, those are all additional, additional things we like to do. So the last thing, this is uh, a picture of Mr. Benjamin here. That brick barn is um, basically fell into itself and was torn down by the family. Um, but uh, Mr. Benjamin, he passed away in 2005, and he loved the property, and we're lucky that his five heirs, his five kids, have, have agreed to sell it to us. <clears throat> in terms of in, in just uh, one more item, Scarborough is really lucky to have a land bond in place. Uh, Scarborough residents have passed three different land bonds totaling $5 million, and Scarborough is the only town in the state to have done that. And we feel it's a, it's a 
the land bond is a, a, essentially a form of town planning. It's residents getting up and going to the ballot and saying, we value open space, we value public access, we value um, the beautiful parts in our town that make it unique, and we value our rural character. And so we really think uh, we're grateful that the land bond is here, and we look forward to working with, with you, the council, and the land bond board. And for us, the Benjamin Farm is the project. So again, we're really pleased to be finally standing in front of you talking about this project in this way. Thank you. I know this has been a really long night for you guys, so we're going to try to do this as quick, quickly as possible. I did want, for the benefit of the new counselors that have not gone through a, a land bond project before, just to go through what the community has done to support um, land acquisition and the land bond and the history of it. And so what were the springboards for land protection in, in Scarborough? And we had two community attitudes surveys and two comprehensive plans in the last 20 years, and all of them set, supported open space. Um, the Growth and Services Report did what's called a Cost of Services Report. In that report, they showed that residential development, which you guys know, costs the town money. You've just been talking about schools. That's the biggest thing. So if you let the town grow without any protection of open space and build out to the capacity, you're going to spend a lot more money. We also had an open space report that was heavily vetted through the um, community, and um, Jeremy did his master's thesis on the economics of land conservation uh, as well. These cost-benefit models for open space versus development are common. There was one done for the town of Scarborough from planning decisions. Professional outside consultant did it for the town of Scarborough. Um, and I will tell you, I'll show you what that, but as Jeremy just said, the land bond, the certainty of the availability of funding is really what is unique about Scarborough. No other community in the state of Maine has ever done this, and we should really, really be proud of it, and the people have supported it, um, but the Benjamin Farm would not be able to be protected if, if they could not come to us at this really tough time in everybody's budgets and come to, um, to the town and ask for, for help for this project. Uh, there were three referendums in town of Scarborough uh, in 2000, 2003, and 2009, totaling $5 million. And you can see what the yes and the no votes. We, um, these, this is how our community voted. These were all at November voting. All of them were three to one or two to one votes in favor of supporting land bonds. Um, so, and it's the, we have, no other town in, in the state of Maine has put that referendum to, uh, referendums like this to the voters as well. Um, the Scarborough Parks and Conservation Land Board was created right after those land uh, bonds were approved to develop an objective way to evaluate properties. So we're not just going to spend it on anything. We, we want to be objective. We don't want to just say, oh, yeah, let's spend it on this land. We want to learn from, um, you know, and protect the best properties. The Benjamin Farm, by the way, has been on the radar ever since the very first land bond because um, it is the property that everybody asks about when they head down to the beach, when they, um, when they pass by. What, what's going to happen with that? It's also one of the properties that was best eyed by developers as well, you know. Um, so anyway, this conservation land board was created and we are appointed as a seven member board to develop an acquisition process, which we did. That was vetted by all of the state agencies, the Maine Department of Fisheries, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, Refuge. They all looked at our acquisition evaluation process and gave comment on it. Um, we are formed to recommend and advise the council, but obviously you have the decisions. Um, we also recommend conditions or restrictions on, on the purchase. Anybody can bring us that we are supposed to be a, a sort of an apolitical body in the sense that the land trust brought us these properties and we, we look at it and say, you know, is this a fair, is this a fair ask of them? And um, so far, since 2000, these are all the properties we've, uh, we've actually protected. Comstock property on the end is not yet completed, but look where we are in acreage, 961 acres. I'm so excited because if we do this project and if you approve it, um, it's going to put us over the, uh, with the Fuller Farm appropriation, it's going to put us over 1,000 acres of protected land in Scarborough, and that's pretty incredible. Um, the AEP, which is what the evaluation uh, 
evaluation, that's what AEP stands for, it scores the properties objectively on soils, the value of soils for, for agriculture, the values of wildlife, the vi values for people and recreation, could be active recreation like ballparks, could be passive recreation, um, and also wildlife protection, endangered species, uh, piping plovers, New England cottontail, all kinds of sorts of things. I had to say that. Um, anyway, it was based on, it's based on science. The larger properties you protect and the bigger pieces, the more species you're going to protect. Plus, you're going to protect wild, you're going to protect um, heavy duty water quality, aquifers, and because it's the headwater of the Spurwink River, we have a bass fish or a, a striper fishery down at the beach, so there's recreational fisheries as well. And I know people down at Higgins will tell you how dirty that river once was, so it's really important. The acquisition evaluation process is we're doing that right now. So what's so big about the um, the property? Uh, Jeremy already went through it. Uh, it's a great property. It, pr it protects rural character and open space. It scored 870 points, which is the si second highest score ever on our evaluation process for historical value, cultural value, and also the net economic value. It's adjacent to um, all kinds of other public and conserved lands. You have that in your, pa your packet. And it, it, what's the biggest and most important thing is its potential for multi-use. Now, there are other things we can do with the property instead of buy it. We can let the Maine Department of Inland Fisheries and Wildlife, the, the land trust, have worked with them for a long time. And they would like to do a New England cottontail project on it. Jeremy, Jer they have not seen uh, New England cottontail, but they believe that if they if they did some clear cutting on the property, um, they could actually produce uh, the New England cottontail habitat. It's an endangered species. And so the Inland Fisheries and Wildlife is wanting to do a mitigation project. Um, and so the Land Trust has worked for a really long time on this. And they were sort of dissatisfied that this was pretty much half the property. Um, they just didn't feel comfortable with it. They didn't know for sure how much money. And the land board also had some uncomfortableness. So the land trust did another proposal and, and asked, you know, if maybe the Inland Fisheries and Wildlife might consider taking part of the Willie property, the Willie Recreation property that's going to be mitigated in addition. But as you can see by the configuration looking at the map, it really cuts Benjamin property right in half. That's going to be a problem for public, or public um, trails back and forth. And we really feel, even the land board, you know, we were saying, okay, so we can accept $925,000 from the main Department of Inland Fisheries and only spend a million locally, but then what are we going to do? Well, you cannot have any people on that for 20 years or any public access. So our recommendation is that we do accept the $2 million. The other option is to let the builders go ahead and build. The estimated build out of Benjamin Farm is 65 houses. This was done by Sebago Technics, um, I think in 96. And each cost per house per year for schools and other services is about $1,194 over uh, 65 houses, which is what the subdivision would be. That would be 77000 dollars a year cost to the town. And Doug Williams was going to be here and give you a financial analysis about what that means in future costs, but when you had when you were spending seventy seven thousand six hundred and ten uh, you're also losing money because the, there's a future value, and it's called an opportunity cost. It's explained in attachment nine in your council packet. Um, you take that and compare it to what the debt value would be for bonding over over um, 30 years and, and subtract it, and the net benefit in, in 15 to 30 years is going to be $2.2 million to the town to actually buy the property instead of letting it be built. If you have any questions later at the second reading or something, we can get Doug perhaps to be here. So this Benjamin property is great. This, this last photo, this is the last slide we have, it shows um, the pond that's right off of Fog Road and Pleasant Hill, and then you see the Benjamin Farm. In the distance, you can see Casco Bay. You can see the Rachel Carson National Wildlife Refuge, and um, you can see what a spectacular piece of property is. Uh, so we recommend um, our recommendation to you included that you should, you know, maintain some rights of easements, and that any agreements between the land trust and the state, if they're going to do any New England cottontail type of project 
that it run through the town as well because the town has a vested interest in, and it, it would be our money. And the, and the land trust, I think, is perfectly comfortable with that. So that's our recommendation to you. We highly support this as a great project. And if you have any questions, there are other people here. <laughs> Okay, um, with that being said, um, I'm going to open this up to uh, public comment. Would anybody from the public like to speak? Name and address, please. Hi, good evening. My name is Susan Oglis and I live at 280 Black Point Road. Um, my parents were living in this house when I was born. and when My family moved away, my paternal grandparents bought the house. And then I bought it back from my grandmother in 1979, and they've been there ever since, which is only to say I've lived on the Scarborough Marsh for a very long time. And over the decades, especially when I first came back, it was very difficult to watch the once what I thought of as slow-growing Scarborough become one of the fastest-growing communities in Maine. And I suddenly realized that um, I was suffering a great deal because what I wanted was no growth. And that just wasn't going to happen. And at that point, I decided that what I was going to do is get involved in the community in terms of trying to provide some tools for planning. Because if you can't, if you can't stop growth, you can plan for growth. So since then, I have, was volunteered on the most recent comprehensive plan committee. I'm on the town planning board and have been for a dozen years. And um, I'm on the long-range planning committee. And all of these groups are trying basically to develop creative tools for land use planning. And one of those tools is obviously the Scarborough Land Acquisition Fund. The Scarborough citizens, as said before, voted not once, not twice, but three times in order to set this up, set up this uh, process for being able to save major open space. You know, somebody, people come up to me in Hannafis and say, I was watching the planning board and I tell them they ought to get a life. And the last time somebody said to me, so tell me about this land trust thing. Um, we don't need open space. We've got all kinds of open space. If you look at a map, you'll see that all over the place there's open space. And actually, they're right. But they're small little pieces uh, of green labeled space, and they're mostly non-developable wetlands. They're not being saved for recreation, though some fossils do have trails that go through them. They're being protected so they can continue to do their job as Mother Nature's sponge absorbing rising water tables with weather events and so on. And that's directly responsible to the, um, um, I'm going to try to say, con conservation development, conservation subdivision ordinance that we've recently put in place here in Scarborough. So, you know, open space is not primarily defined for purely wetland protection. It is to provide public access for passive or active uh, recreation to preserve wildlife and wildlife corridors, to encourage farming where feasible, and as had mentioned, to also help control the density of residential development. And it is my personal belief that there's no better use for the land acquisition monies than to purchase the Benjamin Farm. It does abut the Rachel Carson Preserve, the headwaters of the Spurwing. It's home to a large variety of wildlife. There are varying ways trails can be extended. It's very close to these, this very large um, uh, development area in Scarborough, uh, providing unending educational opportunities. Mr. Benjamin raised cattle on this farm, and so we know that there are many ways that we can use agricultural uh, opportunities here. It's a vast piece of property with the possibility for large residential development in an area that is essentially already built out with hundreds of homes. Residential development obviously does not pay for itself. We've got the whole idea of new schools, public safety, ambulance, police presence, the transportation infrastructure we've talked about, and the sewer demand. So there's no way that we can overlook the fact that open space is not going to only provide the saving of something so beautiful, but it's also going to save an increased burden on the tax base. So I urge you to agree with us, of course, that there's no better use of Scarborough's land acquisition monies than to help us purchase the farm. Thank you very much. Thank you. Would anyone else like to speak from the public? Thank you. My name is Tom Ornello. I live at 15 Williamsburg Lane here in Scarborough. 
I think this is a unique opportunity for the town to purchase this land. I think it's a maybe once in a lifetime opportunity if we pass on this might not ever get a chance to look at something like this and to be able to benefit, the entire town to benefit from the purchase of this land. It truly is unique. I'm very much in favor of this. I'm so much in favor of this that I've joined the fundraising committee for the Scarborough Land Trust and I have been door knocking and talking to my neighbors and getting people really enthused. And I think it's a great opportunity for the town to come together and raise the additional $500,000 that will be needed for this project to be completed. And I know a tremendous amount of people that have been working very hard and some of the people that are planning on working very hard to secure this property. It's a fabulous location. I walk by it, drive by it, I ride my bike by it, I really enjoy it. If there's an opportunity to cross-country ski, to snowshoe, to walk, to hike this property, it's just going to be fantastic and a huge plus for the town of Scarborough. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Seeing none, I close the public hearing. Well, hearing public comment. Do I have a motion? So moved. Second. Okay. <laughs> Council discussion. Councilor Holbrook. Speech to the You know, certainly I, I don't disagree that it would be a significant purchase for, for Scarborough. Um, you know, there's an economic benefit to it not being houses with more kids in the system. Uh, my, my only concern is um, with the total dollar amount because at this point, and I appreciate that three times in the past that we've had voter support, um, but those were also very different economic times. And the likelihood of something passing to that magnitude now is slim and none. So, you know, what we have left in the account is, um, I think it's about 2.4 million. Um, certainly we've done a lot with that, you know, like like it was mentioned in the presentation, it's 961 acres. I'm sure this tips our scale up to about 1,000 acres. Um, but I, I want to go back to something, um, the money. <laughs> I want to come back to the money. And, um, you know, I'm a little nervous ex exhausting the fund because as much as it was, yes, meant to buy bulk land like this, there were also other things created within that for the use of this fund. And it's not really being used for anything other than the land. Um, and I'm just going to read you another tidbit. Um, it's also for historic preservation, which we've done little of. Yes, we've bought a lot of land. And, and again, I mean no disrespect, it's still a great project. I'm a little, <coughs> like I said, nervous about the spending of the money, but I I'm going to read it to you. Um, Community character and historical significance. Lands of community character are areas that are unique to it. I can read this little tiny print. Hold on a minute. <laughs> Basically, it, it just, you know, like I said, um, exceptional importance to the town of Scarborough's landscape, culture, and history. Historical areas include, but are not limited to, land, structures, sites, and monuments. Now, as you know, I've been involved with the Historic Preservation Committee. We're about to release about 100 different properties that are historically significant. And we also, as a council, received a list of 20 properties that are historically significant and highly in danger in town. So, again, I, I'm nervous about exhausting the fund, knowing that we're facing the likelihood of not seeing another bond approved anytime soon. Um, so. I guess I appreciate that you are fundraising for a portion of it. Um, I guess if I could, if I could ask a question. Um, if we allow the two million, do you stop your fundraising at the five, or do you go as high as you can with your fundraising and only ask for the two million if you don't have it? Well, I, I think for us to raise uh, for us to raise five hundred thousand dollars is is a pretty tall order. So. Um, we're a very small land trust, and to raise half a million dollars in basically a year is a huge challenge. So we're concerned about even that number. Um, we're ready to do it, and we're trying right now, but that's, that's a stretch for us. Um, 
that's part of the reason why we take this so seriously, the, the passing on the New England Cottontail. That was a, a big thing for us. Um, but we feel that this is the best way to, to protect the Benjamin Farm property. Um, one, one thing I would say about the historical that we didn't put in the presentation, and I'm not even sure it's in your packet. At, uh, well, I think it is somewhere very hidden in there that there was an RT, there is a lot of historic history, and most of that history was presented by the land trust during their um, presentation about farming. And the one thing that I see is that there is just no farmland on that side of the out of uh, the turnpike, really. I so one of the things that would be really uh, exciting would be as if we could see another working farm there, but I don't know that that's an issue. But I, I mean, that's sister. I'm just saying. I just I'm going to go back to my initial point: is you have to take what you have and spread it around to the best use of it. We've preserved a thousand acres, so although I do plan on supporting it tonight, at this point, as a town with our land bond funds, we've supported a th almost a thousand acres. Um, tread carefully because if this fund is exhausted, almost a good chunk of our historic preservation work will be moved because there is no fund to utilize. Um, so again, I just caution about spreading what limited funds we have around a little bit. Okay. Um, who's uh, Councilor Blaze? Yeah, uh, I'd like to ask a question. Uh, one of your slides that said approximately 136 plus or minus acres in, in the farm. Now I had heard, I had heard quite a while ago that a big chunk of that is considered wetlands. Is that true? Yes. So the property was originally, I think, 126 acres on the tax maps. We did a survey that came out to around 135 or so. And um, the middle swath, um, if you see, if you go to where those three houses are, sort of in the middle of the property on Pleasant Hill Road, um, and you go sort of back into the interior to that, um, where that stand of trees is, that's the sort of the wetland swath that goes down the middle of the property, sort of the spine of the property. So that, essentially, the, a big part of the middle is, is very wet. So does that prevent the use of the land for anything other than well, Mr. Benjamin, I think he liked it because the cattle always had water, but um, <laughs> we would have to be just cre uh, a little more creative in doing trails and things like that, um, a bridge crossing, things like that. You can, we can cross as you go into the interior of the property by the, by the trees because there's a knoll, there's a hill there, so you can get up, up and but down that. That wetlands prevented the land from really being developed. Didn't it? No, well, there, there was a there was a Sebago Technics yeah. plan uh, that showed about 60, 65 houses there, and you can see where that the houses were not located, um, and essentially that's all the that's all the wetland there. Okay. Uh, yes, I mean th there are significant wetlands on the property, though. Yes, I, I agree. Thank you. Okay, uh, Councilor Donovan. Uh, can we get more information on the Cottontail project? It sounded like there was a reference to a 20-year limitation. Yeah, so we, we worked on that for probably, I want to say, three, three plus months. Um, and there's a mitigation fund that uh, Inland Fisheries and Wildlife has access to. And essentially, they were proposing to use um, that fund on Benjamin Farm. And initially, we thought, great, it sounds perfect, and we'll be able to um, uh, spread some of the funding load around. And the more we looked into the project and the more discussions we had with Inland Fisheries and Wildlife, um, the project came to be essentially, can you go back one? Mm -hmm. um, this here, which is basically 54 acres of Benjamin Farm, they were proposing to get in a 20-year management agreement. And that land is basically off limits for people, no trails, no access, and a lot of the trees would be cut down because the rabbits prefer basically almost impenetrable, shrubby, thicket habitat. So we were disappointed. Um, the, first, the first couple iterations before this had more acres proposed. Um, we went back and forth, back and forth with them, and we just felt that to lose that much of the property for any public access and people was just not something that um, we felt was, was workable. And after 20 years, what would happen? 
Uh, we, uh, short answer is we don't know. Um, if there are rabbits, uh, we can assume that they might want to, you know, have like an automatic trigger of a renewal. Um, we haven't actually seen the 20-year management agreement, but um, we've heard that if the if it's one of these things, if you do a good job with the rabbits, you're, you know, almost looking at a renewal of the management agreement. Um, we don't know that for sure, but uh, that's one of the concerns we also had. What happens to rare animals? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we, we've, I mean, we've, we've done New England cottontail projects on other on other properties, Libby River Farm, Fuller Farm. So we, I mean, we're fully in support of it. This is just such a high-profile property that we just think that people deserve to be able to walk on it. And um, so we just we see a little bit of a conflict between. Um, this map here and, and goals for the property. I mean, it's such a fabulous place oh, that yeah. it's unique to the, the geography of the town. It's mm -hmm. in a location that doesn't have anything like it, and, and, and the economics of, of keeping it away from residential development mm -hmm. makes all the sense in the world. It's Jessica's point's well taken, mm -hmm. that, that if you take a long look beyond 20 years, mm -hmm. that, that it's sort of cake and eat it too. That if the, if the uh, money doesn't come with strings that would extend beyond 20 years, then it demonstrates at least an affordable direction to go. Mm -hmm. It just it probably is worth looking at, at least having the council know enough about it mm -hmm. to be able to at least take it into account. Mm -hmm. We struggled with this issue, and uh, that's why we we. So we had to show you this map and the following one. It's a uh, it's a decision we don't take lightly at all. Councilor Donovan, just uh, um, I was approached about the same issue with Cottontail, yeah. so I uh, investigated <coughs> the issue, and they're making the right decision. It's <laughs> very, it, it would become very restrictive of yeah. your property rights. Yeah. So it's best to, I, best to stay clear of that, I say. Okay, uh, Councilor Kennedy? Yeah, I, I mean, I'm very supportive of, of preserving this land. Um, just some more Katerina Mass, if you want to hear it. <laughs> it comes down to $18,382 an acre at $2.5 million, which is a damn good deal for land, and I know... There's some people in the audience who are realtors who would agree with me that for Scarborough land, that's a pretty good deal. Um, however, you know, I, I also would want to be looking at, uh, Jessica does have a good point. I mean, do we tap out most of what's in the bond fund, knowing, I mean, the, everyone who's here saw so all the people who are here who don't like to spend money and, you know, what are our chances of getting any, any more land bonds passed in the near future, um, so that, that that's my only thing too. I wish there were. I wish the cottontail development was could be smaller, not take up so much of the land, maybe, um, or if there were some other funding. I'm sure you guys have gone to all of the. I hope the big funders in the world who want to fund conservation lands and whatever. There's something that I, I didn't. We didn't mention this just because we wanted to be really really quick, but. Just like everything's dried up at the state, oh, it's dried up in terms of nonprofits and granting. We have uh, huge leverages on our earlier properties, two to one, three to one. Um, Land for Maine's future, bonds that have already been approved, the, 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 you know, they are not letting that money go. Um, the, you know, the governor's oh. saying no. So there's projects in the loop. So Land for Maine's future is, is not is not available right now to to this project in particular, although it, this project would definitely qualify and be a high priority. It's just that all these projects are being put on the back burner almost like every other budget item. The one thing I want to point out here is that, like I said, since 2000, this property, uh, Maureen Sweeney, that we've gone through three, we, I say we, I wasn't really on the land trust, but we went through three executive directors of the land trust. This property was on, this, we wanted this the, to be the first property um, for the land bond. We thought we had it. It was going to happen. Nope, didn't happen. Didn't happen. And so it's taken this long to be here. And so this and this opportunity won't come back again. So that's one thing. Um, the other thing I 
So, but the land trust is, I, it's my understanding you guys are going to be going out for grant funds and they may get some grant funds and if you want to talk more about that with them but but nothing is in stone and that and that's the problem um i don't know i think that those land bond funds are not allowed to be used for structures is what i had understood i think it can be used for historical sites but not for structures i don't know mm -hmm. but i'm pretty sure that's what it must do that was the other uh, Councillor Benedict, you'll be next. Thank you. Yep. I just have a question. Did, did you people try to look at expending the whole fund and then not having any money? There's going to be $400,000 left. You, are you saying the Parks and Conservation or are you asking that for the land trust? The land trust came to us and asked us for a certain amount of money, a range, and at that time it was about 1.7 or 1.5 to 2, and they were going to take money from the state, or they were thinking they'd take the money from the state, and they'd ask us for less. But then when the state came, and, and they didn't know how much the state would give them, then they found out what the state would give them, but then they had this. They came back and said, you know, we really would like to have more, and so it leaves about four hundred thousand dollars into the in in the land fund. Is that did I answer your question? In proportion, the uh, next case scenario, what's four hundred thousand going to buy? Well, some of some of the projects have been less than four hundred thousand. The Fuller Farm was able to be purchased with two hundred and fifty thousand dollar appropriation. Um, the Libby River Farm was a five hundred thousand dollar plus grants. So there were properties that were a lot of properties actually were were bought for less than four hundred thousand. Not a lot. Well, yeah, actually, a, f a few. A couple, and maybe we can get those answers for you next meeting. Um, I think over the course of a land bond's life, the um, leverage, say, on $100 has been about 42, 42, do, 42 to 58. Mm -hmm. So um, that's really good leverage. So if you're talking about the $400,000, um, uh, you know, that that's, has the ability to leverage additional funds as well. So, I mean, I think the Scarborough has done a really good job with the land bond in terms of turning... Um, the the three three and a half million dollars that's been spent into almost into base into double that in terms of attracting other funds. What one of the slides we didn't include was actually that leverage. We could show that to you too if you're interested. So say the, the, out of this amount of money that we've spent in the land bond for this project for say Jarvis, we spent fifty thousand. We also got seventy thousand from the state. You know, mm -hmm. we could we have that slide. We just didn't include it. But if you want it, we can. Council Blaze, just one quick question: Is the sale price of the farm two million dollars? Is that two point two two five? Where's the two point five million come from? Basically, uh, that is project costs. We have things like survey, appraisal, environmental assessment. Um, we've got um, uh, title work, legal, a project consultants. Um, we've also got uh, our. We have a. a Okay. <laughs> and, and another part of that, too, is also stewardship. So we're trying to be really smart about this property in terms of um, the best time, uh, you know, to, to, you know, for us to do our fundraising for stewardship is, is when everything is um, in motion. And so if you do it after you've protected the property, it becomes much harder. Councilor Sinclair? No, I'm not. Oh, okay. okay. Um, Councilor Donovan. Can you put the subdivision plan back up? Sure. Oh, is that forward or backwards? Uh, there it is. Right there. So Have you given any thought to uh, <laughs> kind of whether you could uh, carve out the portion that's nearest to the developed <laughs> land to the west? Uh, uh, there's, I think, about 14 lots there, and it f has frontage on the street. So it's, it's the least wild of all the property, and it's, it obviously would have a great value to a developer because mm -hmm. it's easier to develop when you don't have long roadway systems mm -hmm. or, or other infrastructure. So that might generate uh, a substantial amount of cash and yet give you the lion's share of the property. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's been considered. 
we uh, we thought about um, we thought about uh, we looked at it in a little different terms, but slightly related. Um, in a conservation, looking for a conservation buyer, if everything is about to go down and we're short, what do we do? That is, um, that's probably, we, we viewed it as a, basically a fallback. If we have three or four months to put something together and funds aren't there, what happens? So that's, that's how we viewed that land of the west, the corner by Williamsburg Place. Um, but from our perspective as a land trust, it's when people see that property, part of the challenge is when people drive by, that, that area where houses are on the left or the west, that's essentially a big view shed going into the interior of the property. It's a little hard to see now because you've got a lot of trees that have grown up, no, but do. that is a, um, it's an important view shed because the other side of the property you sort of go up and so you can't see into the interior. So we would lose, um, we would lose some of the scenic value for people driving by the property. Just worth, worth noting, Jeremy and I have talked through the years about this. I know that property ha happens to have some of the best soils on the property. And that, that section, yeah. That section in particular, and community gardens or some sort of use for the community would be most sensible closest to the the street level as well. Yes. All right. Did I get my crack at that. <laughs> All right. Uh, this is for my uh, fellow counselors. I, you know, um, out in the community, it's saying uh, I've been asked. You, you guys aren't really going to consider buying the Benjamin property, and I'm like, yeah, why? Well, here's how I look at it. And we, we, um, the people voted to build a new school, and we didn't say no. People voted to buy a new ladder truck, we didn't say no to it. Well, this is the same case. People uh, of Scarborough voted to have a land trust to buy uh, property. Um, there's still going to be some funds left in that account, hopefully enough to cover some of, you know, um, Council Holbrook's concerns. But the way I look at it is the people voted this money in to for us to buy uh, land for open space. And I'm going to honor that, that will of the people to... Um, that wanted this land purchased, and it's been talked about for a long, long time, and it's uh, finally here. Um, and um, we, uh, I think, our position is, uh, you know, the the town said yes. Here, this the funds will expend, and we expect the council to uh, make the decisions on the quality of the property that we purchase. And if this isn't a high-quality piece of property for the town to purchase for open space, I, I don't know what is. So um, I think that's where our judgment and our decisions are made, not in the, the price tag. Um, we have an allotment, like I said, not to repeat myself, that was voted on by the people of Scarborough. And we're managing that allotment along with the land trust. So uh, I'm I'm supporting it, and I'll probably get, catch crap about it, but <laughs> that's the way it goes. That's that's what the people voted. I, I would just remind the council, Sue made reference to it, but there's a very elaborate uh, evaluation process. So this is not a subjective process. It's as objective as you could possibly make it, and and I'm just I I marvel every time I look at that process and how um, how detailed it is, and so. Mm -hmm. Uh, we all have, you all have your own opinions about a property right. or, or another, but this is intended to be as objective as possible to rate it on all of its value. And, and the other thing is, you know, it's just like the, um, I, I get questions all the time on why did you do this, why did you do that? Well, the town also voted on comprehensive plan. And, you know, this is pi also part of the comprehensive plan, just like uh, sidewalks are and pedestrian ways. Thing. I don't look at it as any different. I, it wasn't my decision. It was the people of Scarborough's decision. I don't know if that changed anyone's mind, but it's my two cents. Any other? Okay. That being said, all those in favor? Opposed? No. 
Okay. Do we have to go to the ten o'clock thing? Okay. Okay. Non-action items. How do you figure that? No non-action items. Okay. Well, we'll move on to standing committees. Uh, uh, let's do. Um, Council Hoper. Are you prepared? <coughs> um, I'm actually going to be asking to That's why spend I the rules. That's why I want to do first. <coughs> uh, um, spend the rules, so um, this will be in the form of a motion um, so that we could appoint this evening some applications that we have had to some various committees because that work needs to get underway. Um, so again, this will be in the form of a motion to suspend the rules and Nominate for Canine Education and Enforcement Ad Hoc Committee, mm -hmm. Kathleen Foley, Cheryl LaRue, Catherine Rogers, Pamela Rovner, and Leon Summers, or Liam, sorry, uh, for the Personal Appeals Board, applicant Arthur Dillian, Dillon, for Self, I can talk tonight, sorry, Selfish Conservation Commission, Liam Erickson, and for the Zoning Board, um, Gordon Stanhope. Is, um, did you have a second? No. Oh, I needed a second. Second. Okay. Discussion. Um, yeah. I guess that I just would add, um, again, to, to the folks that have volunteered their time. Um, some are new and some are old. And, again, just thank you for your time. Um, it's always appreciated when somebody is willing to serve on one of our committees and um, basically is most of what we do here at the council comes out of committees. So um, again, thank you for your time. Okay, motion on the floor to suspend the rules. All those in favor? Opposed. And um, nope. we need to vote on the appointments now. We have to vote on the appointments. Yes, move, so. approval to, um, move approval of the appointments that I look Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> we get a second. Second. Is there any discussion on the names of the point? None. Okay. With that being said, all those in favor? Thank you. Okay. Back to standing committees. Uh, we'll start with... Council St. Clair. Um, I don't have anything tonight because pretty much everything um, ordinance was my big mm -hmm. committee, right? And I think we just covered everything for me. So thank you. Councilor Blaze. None. Councilor Benedict. Ditto. None. <laughs> okay. Councilor Katerina. Um, just long range planning. We we have been working on uh, Gorham Road, some looking at some conservation, you know, ideas for different types of conservation rules. Also, I was pretty excited to learn that there's been some inquiries from businesses uh, with interest in the Hagas Parkway, which would be good. So, yeah, well, that's it for me. Tulsa Donovan. Yeah, no, have not. Uh, Energy or SEDCO or finance hasn't met since we last met, although I did get some good support from uh, Karen in, uh, at SEDCO regarding uh, uh, per capita income issues uh, uh, data for the towns that were being used in the school analysis. So I want to say thank you to her for, for that information. I'll save mine for next time. <coughs> save it for next time. I can't it's a good thought. Okay. Uh, now manage the report. Yes, I'll be very, very brief. I just wanted to update uh, the rest of council and the public uh, staff and two members of uh, council, Councilor Donovan and Chairman Sullivan, and, uh, and staff met with representatives from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service yesterday. And I think we had a productive meeting. They were very interested in um, knowing some of the particulars of how the ordinance was to be, ordinances are to be um, implemented and administered, and we were, had the occasion to really share a lot of the details of 
educational things underway, the monitoring program. So uh, we thought it was a very productive meeting. I presume they're taking that input into consideration uh, as regards the settlement agreement and the fine. So I suspect within relatively near future we'll know more about um, those matters. Just very quickly, um, for your calendar, the Scarborough Community Chamber tomorrow, as a matter of fact, is having their annual meeting at the Black Point Inn. Um, that's 12 to 2. And GP Cog's annual meeting is Wednesday, June 18. Uh, again, over the lunch hour, 11.30 to 2.30 at the USM Glickman Library. And lastly, uh, the fire department's going to have an open house at Black Point Fire Station, and really to showcase the new Ladder 2. This is the, the new uh, purchase that was approved by the voters, and we took delivery last month, so they're very excited to open the doors and show that to the public. Uh, again, this Black Point Fire Station, Saturday, June 14, 10 to 2. Thank you. Mm -hmm. With that being said, now we're into council and member comments. Like to start? Council Holber. Don't forget to vote yeah. on the school budget, student tax, and uh, when is absentee? No. It is available now, so anytime. Come on down, fill out a ballot. Councilor Donovan. I'm good. Thank you. Councilor Canarina. Just one thing. Um, I'm going to have an open office hour Wednesday, June 11th, the day after the election. So if you're not happy with what happens, come on in to see me. Wednesday, June 11th, 5.30 to 6.30, manager's conference room here at Town Hall. That's not That's big enough. <laughs> <laughs> Be quiet. Councilor Benedict. Nothing? Okay, Council Blaze. Council Blaze. Uh, I'd just like to thank everybody that sent out emails on the school budget, both pro and con, and the input was very useful. And there were, believe it or not, a lot of wonderful ideas yeah. that came out that we certainly should be taking a look at in the coming year. Okay. So I want to thank everybody. Council of St. Clair. I'm good, thank you. All right, I'll um, <clears throat> end it with, um, I received from the public lots of input by phone, a lot of phone calls I received, and I received uh, lots of emails on both sides of the budget issue. Um, I, I apologize, I didn't respond to a lot of emails, and I have a pretty good reason for that. I <laughs> am almost like a single parent. Uh, my wife uh, fell and broke her ankle and had to have surgery and uh, plates and screws and everything else put in, so I'm, uh, I'm playing dad mom and it's been pretty hectic and um, I've heard from her a couple of times, will you put that damn computer down? <laughs> so, um, so I've had all the house chores and everything else plus my regular work and job, so it's I do apologize for that. I do try to get back to my emails, but I did read them all, and uh, I paid attention. So, and that's why I uh, arrived at my decision of uh, 2.9, and uh, I said that you know um, neither side's going to be happy with that, but I feel felt that that was the right thing to do, and that's that's what I did, and. Um, I, I hope that uh, going to the polls, um, people can see the reasoning behind 2.9 and vote yes and uh, move the budget ahead. And uh, that would be June 10th, yeah. and everybody should show up. Um, at the high school. At the high school. So um, it's also Democratic primary, right? The primary for the Democrats, right. Republicans, and Green Independents. Yeah. Right. So, um, yeah, everybody um, in town needs to get out and vote. Um, it's very important. And um, I mean, I know a lot of people said tonight that they were busy with things going on in their life, and um, like uh, we all are. 
uh, and I don't mean to brag, but since I was 18, I've never missed an election. I worked 24-hour shifts in the fire department for 27 years, and I've always made time to vote. I'll come early in the morning and be one of the first ones in line to vote in the morning before I go to work. So, and there's absentee ballots. So I don't see any excuse why. There's no excuse when I talk to people and they say, "Well, I, I didn't. No, I didn't vote. Well, I had this going on, that going on. I, I'm very busy in my life too, but I make time for that uh, very important um, thing that uh, was given to us to vote. So, um, with that being said, um, motion to adjourn. So, so moved. Second. All those in favor? Done. <laughs>